welcome to the MMA Roundtable. It's the 32nd edition of the show, May 21st, 2013, and it is a special UFC weekend that we had one last weekend and one next weekend. Vitor Belfort with an incredible knockout victory over Luke Rockhold at UFC on FX8. We'll be talking about that card along with UFC 160 this Saturday. We'll be breaking that down along, of course, with the week in MMA news, our boneheads of the week, and guess that tweet. Let's do it. And once again, thank you so much for tuning in to the MMA Roundtable. Today we got uh, a, a panel of four gentlemen. Uh, we have myself, we have Ray and Jay from MMA Mental, and we have a new guy on the show. We've got Eric from MMA Troll and MMA Linker. Uh, first off, though, we'll uh, get all of the plugs and the pleasantries out of the way. Ray, what's going on with MMA Mental? Yeah, we've had, a, we've had another good week. I've just interviewed uh, Dwayne Bang Ludwig talking about uh, the way he's turned uh, Team Alpha Male around into from wrestlers to, to strikers. So that was good. Uh, and I've had some, personally, I've had some good news this week. I've been given my first commentary position. So I'll be commentating for Cage Contender, which is the number one promotion in Ireland. And it's also on television in Ireland as well. So I'm obviously very excited for that. Hell yeah, that, we uh, were just talking about that recently, You're, uh, I mean, from getting UFC press passes to now being the commentator at Cage Contenders in Ireland, Ireland's biggest MMA promotion, uh, you're making big waves, and Ray Thompson, uh, he will be in a household near you shortly. Um, so definitely check out MMA Mental, check out that interview with Dwayne Ludwig, and if you haven't checked out their classic interviews with people of the likes like Bruce Buffer, uh, Tyson Fury, he's got some great interviews, so go check that out at MMAMental.com. Speaking of which, the newest podcast in the MMA Mental Family is uh, the Early Stoppage Podcast with Jay Jeans, who recently had resident fighter uh, from from the playground, T. Cunningham, on uh, what what is going on with the Early Stoppage Podcast. Podcast. Yeah, man, we had a, another just fantastic show this week. Thirty-minute podcast. So if you got thirty minutes in your in your long week, then check out my podcast, man. We had Tyson Cunningham on, as Jake mentioned. He's a semi-professional fighter fighting on the uh, west coast of America, and yeah, it was great to chat to him. Great to catch up to him. We reviewed the last event we talked about the next event and yeah we played the early stoppage and he bought it back for the uh for the guests yeah he won the early stoppage this week but check it out guys a lot of laughs and a lot of fun i think i'm one and one in the early stoppage right in the early stoppage game yeah you are uh ray (sighs) Ray was able to beat me but then patrick let you down i'm afraid patrick you son of a bitch and i uh mentioned we have got got a new face on the mma roundtable we have eric on the show from mma troll and mma linker uh you uh want to shout out them and tell us how how to uh find mma troll and mma linker eric yeah man i mean uh pretty new face on the podcast props to ray for uh for hitting me up and giving me uh the opportunity but yeah, just on Facebook, it's just simple. The MMA Troll, just look us up. We uh we post all news, everything news oriented. But we also do some, you know, jokingly post. You know, a lot of people don't care for. But you know, that's why we're named the MMA Troll. You know, you got to get a little a little discussion going. You got to have a little little bit of heated heated debates going on. And also MMA Linker, if you've never been there, you have to check it out. We're uh, probably one of the biggest, one of the bigger forums uh, when related to MMA. We got everything you could look for: um, videos, five videos, forums, discussions, signature betting. You know anything that you could look for. And shout out to all the guys on there. And I'll, I'll definitely be uh, sharing this podcast on there as well if it's cool. Fuck yeah! And uh, it it is your uh, first show, so. Uh... So tell us a little bit about yourself. You're uh, from West Virginia, right? Yeah, I'm from a small rural community in uh, southern West Virginia where MMA is largely unpopular. It's uh, it's very few and far between that you find a legitimate uh, fan of the sport. Most people around here still refer to the sport as, you know, do you train UFC? Do you train that UFC stuff? You know, it, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, pre- it's pretty shitty. But uh, I actually only have one friend that uh, I have been able to coerce into 
you know, the world of MMA. Shout out to Jaron. You know, he's he's a big fan. Ray knows him. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been a fan since um, the first fight I remember seeing, I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it, UFC 34, I think uh, Newton, Carlos Newton versus Matt Hughes with the uh, the power bomb slam knockout. That's right. Yeah. That was the first fight I can recall watching. Yeah, that was the Newton Hughes and the Randy Couture Pedro Hizo heavyweight championship. Uh, yeah, so so you uh, definitely know your fair share of MMA, and I'm sure you uh, got a lot to bring to the podcast. So we're glad to have have you along board for this podcast and future roundtables. Um, and, uh, Ray, I think you wanted to shout one, uh, one more thing out as well. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm starting, MMA Mental starting another new show this week. We're only going to be coming on, on the weeks of UFC and we're going to be breaking down the main card fights or the best fights on the card. And it's going to be myself, uh, Brooks Bailey, uh, people will obviously know him from the, uh, from, uh, from any MMA community as uh, playground samurai or GSP fan he's formerly known as. Uh, but our, our, our uh, diamond in the rough, our third leg on the on the podcast is going to be UFC and Tough Seventeen middleweight Luke Barnett. So we're obviously excited about getting that up and running as well. So that's definitely one to look out for. That'll be published uh, this Friday. Team Dark Side represent, and that kind of ties into my shout outs. Uh, check out my boy Ramsey's show, The Word on the Street. We do it every Tuesday and Thursday. Myself, Ramsey's, and uh, and both both our you know the uh, word on the street show and the show you were just talking about Ray both of them have a third leg of a member of Team Dark Side. You have Luke Barnett, and we got the living legend Coach Jamie Huey, uh, the boxing coach to to Chael Sonnen, nicest guy in the freaking world. Uh, so it's always fun to uh, check that out. It's it's underground as hell. So definitely check out the word on the street. Follow my boy Ramsey's on Twitter at the Aunt Jimmy Show. Uh, follow us on Twitter, The MMA Podcast. We do this show, The MMA Roundtable, normally every Thursday at 5 o'clock Eastern. Uh, we're doing it Tuesday of this week because I'm driving to Texas for a wedding tomorrow morning. And we also do The MMA Podcast, which is every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. So check those out. Um, and if we, we want to follow you all on uh, Twitter, Ray's Ray's at MMA Mental, I know. Jay's at J underscore Jeans. How uh, how how would would we follow you on uh, Twitter, Eric? Um, uh, let me think. Uh, my Twitter name is Eric D. Uh, no, wait a minute. Uh, Rico R I C O capital M M A ninety nineteen ninety. That, that's how you follow me on Twitter. So follow Rico R I C O M M A ninety to follow him on Twitter. Follow us all on Twitter. We're a big happy MMA family, and we love doing this shit. And we've been talking about seven or eight minutes about all this bullshit. It's time to get into the actual MMA news. UFC on FX eight this past Saturday. Um, we we've uh, got got the top three fights to uh, talk about. But uh, really quick, what what was your your uh, favorite moment of UFC on FX eight? Was it that spinning heel kick by Vitor? Or was it anything off of the prelims, uh, Ray? I'm going to cheat. I've got two moments. The the wheel kick was fantastic. I mean, I did not see that coming at all. But the opening fight of the night, uh, and if people missed that fight, I really feel sorry for them. Uh, Lucas Martins and Jeremy Larson. Oh my god! If you haven't seen that fight, you've got to go and watch it. These two guys literally left everything in that cage. I mean, it, they were. They get, both got knocked down over and over again. It was an, it was a, f- a fantastic fight, and I was so glad it went fight of the night. Jay, my mo- yeah, my moment's got to go to Jacare. I mean, the easy choice is of course Belfort, but for me, seeing as soon as the fight hit the mat, everybody knew that it was game over. Kamosi tried his best, but that choke it took him four seconds to go from it's on to he's out, and that is just that is ridiculous. Fair play, Jacare. Fair play, Jack Array. What was your favorite moment of UFC on FX8, Eric? Uh, like like the previous guy said, uh, the easy pick would be v- uh, Vitor with the spinning heel kick. You know, it was it was fantastic. And not only did did he land it, but prior to that, he had thrown one with the opposite leg. So that just shows some some incredible versatility that he could throw it fluently from both sides and then land it, you know, perfectly and catch him. But I uh, 
I'm kind of a sucker for the body shots, and I was just I just really enjoyed watching uh, Fabio Maldonado in the uh, in the third round against Roger Hall at landing body shots. Yeah, I was um, actually thinking that Jay's little side game on the MMA playground, we uh, were going to see someone finish the fight via body shots, but it was not to be. That That still was was an amazing fight um, with uh, with your, your boy Fabio Maldonado, de- beating, I was going to say, de- defeating, and my brain turned it to beating last second, defeating Roger Hole via unanimous decision. Um, <clears throat> I uh, personally like. I'm I'm a big fan of Chris Camozzi, but Jacare Souza, that technical sub, he he is, and he is a, such a great fighter. I cannot wait to see how high he can climb the middleweight ranks and whether or not he'll be able to get a title shot. Um, <clears throat> we will uh, start off though with Rafael Dos Anjos defeating Evan Dunham via a unanimous judges nod, twenty nine to twenty eight across the board. Simply put, did Dunham get robbed? I think most of us will agree on this. Even Dana White tweeted out that Evan Dunham got robbed. Um, what What do you think, Ray? Did Did Evan Dunham get the shaft on Saturday? I was surprised with the decision. <clears throat> I mean, it just seems to me that the judges don't like Evan Dunham because I remember watching him a while back against Sean Shirk, and he, I mean, he battered him on the feet. He came close to submitting him twice, and somehow Shirk got the decision. And it's the same again. I. I mean, it was this what fight was closer, but going to decision, I thought Evan Dunham would win. But yeah, I was gutted for him because he just he just needs a break. I think he's such a talented fighter, but he's just had a few bad breaks. But yeah, I was really disappointed to see him and lose the fight. I thought it was the wrong decision. Evan Dunham's been quite um, quite unlucky in his last fights. I mean, you had that split decision against T. Bow. I can't actually remember the fight before. Was that a uh, TJ Grant? Maybe that rings a bell. But this fight, it was another, another one of these close fights. You can't, I don't see how you could argue one case for, uh, one case for so and so won the fight. It was a very, very close fight. When you get statistical about it, there was two punches in it. Evan Dunham tried, I think it was eight takedowns and he'd only got three. So if you're looking on it from effective grappling, yeah, Dunham might have got the take, uh, takedowns, but Rafael Dos Anjos did a good job of defending, just as good a job than Dunham. The striking, I mean, Dunham got the extra two punches, but man, uh, Dunham was throwing so many more. His striking accuracy was something like 10% less. If you're going to come down to statistics, Rafael Dos Anjos was effective in terms of striking and grappling. I I had the fight exact. I actually had it 29-29. I thought this second round was a draw. But that's just me. It was a close fight, and I don't think you could really... You can't really say so-and-so won the fight, because it was it was even all the way. Yeah, I'll, I'll agree and concur with uh, with the rest of you guys. It was, it was a very, very, very close fight, just like most of Evan Dunham's fight. And uh, you were correct. Uh, his fight prior to the T-Bow fight was TJ Grant, another really close fight. <clears throat> I uh, I actually like I got the 22 points for the hot bout on playground, but it, it kind of did leave me with a bad taste in my mouth. Especially with it being in Brazil, I mean, you kind of you kind of thought it was going to happen. If it was going to be close, they the judges do tend to favor the uh, the countrymen in most in most occurrences. But yeah, I mean, the second round, Dunham uh, Dunham got two takedowns, but. Dos Anjos was down for less than probably three seconds in both takedowns. So, like, you got to think how how much do you favor those takedowns? But it, it was just such such a close round. And I'll agree with uh, I'll agree with Jay there. Like, I I can see that that round being scored a, a draw and the fight possibly ending up in a draw. But yeah, it was just a really close fight. And personally, I thought it may have gotten robbed from fight of the night. Yeah, that's that's a very good. Good point, and I love what you said about the takedowns because people, you know, want want to say, and you know, if if you take a guy down twice, you've won the round. Not necessarily. I mean, if the guy springs up, then what purpose has that takedown served? It it's you know pretty much the same thing as stuffing a takedown. If you hop up immediately after, I mean, the actual act of being taken down can injure you, but for the most part, it's not going to injure you any more than than a punch. Um, the uh, fight fight metric, I'm uh, looking at it right now. It was so extremely close. Um, D- Dos Anjos landed 66 signature strikes. Dunham landed 68. 
Dos Anjos landed 86 total strikes. Dunham landed 90. Do, uh, Dos Anjos was a little bit more effective, throwing less strikes, but they landed just about the same exact uh, um, amounts of blows. And you got to respect Evan Dunham. Um, you know, we we see a lot of guys cry foul after they lose, whether they blame the commission or the other fighter or the judges. But Evan Dunham tweeting after the fight, quote unquote. Tough fight. Don't agree with the decision like usual. Thanks everyone for for the love. Um, you know he he uh, pretty much ad- admitting that uh, yeah when things go to the judges you can't always get it your way. Dana White said it a million times. If you want to win the fight, don't let it go to the judges because uh, we'll uh, you know especially in a close fight like like this I do agree with with Jay. You can't point at either guy and say he was the clear cut winner. So that's what what happens with a close fight that goes to the judges. Um, I was not in the same boat as Eric, unfortunately. I picked an Evan Dunham unanimous nod, so I got zero points on the hot bout. It made me sad. Uh, but one one bout I think most of us uh, picked correctly, Jacare Souza defeating Chris Camozzi via a beautiful first round technical arm triangle submission. Um, I don't really want to talk too much about the fight because I think the fight went the way most of us thought it would go. Jacare just uh, out outclassing a young Chris Camozzi, who I do think has a bright UFC career, but Jacques Array has just turned it on the last couple of years. We already know he's he's one of the best ground guys in the UFC, but he knocked out Derek Brunson in the first round last year. The guy's on a tear, and he looked impressive. He, there were no UFC jitters for uh, Jacques Array, so sort of focusing on R- Ronaldo Souza, who... Who's next for Jacare, and where is his ceiling? Will will he he ever you know get to a title fight, and does he have the chance of becoming the next UFC middleweight champion? Jay, sorry man, my my headset was all over the place. Um, Jacare Souza, it was it was another crazy. It was one of those fights where you predicted it from the offset. You you knew that Jacare was going to win, but. Um, it was just a question of how long it would take him to get the takedown. He got the brilliant, I think he got a sweep from the uh, from the back. It was just fantastic. And once the fight hit the floor, you knew Jacques Ray was gonna gonna win it. Um, he, like I said earlier, it was my favorite moment of the night. You know, he had the submission within about four seconds of applying it. Camozzi tried to turn, but it was already in. Um, as for the as for how far he's going to go in this division, it depends who who they're going to give him. Is in right now in the rankings, you've got to really put him above Rockhold just because he's got a UFC win and Rockhold doesn't. I think a fight with Akami is quite an interesting one. However, I think Bisping Bisping's a nice name as we haven't really seen Bisping fight a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu practitioner in a long time i think that's a very interesting fight jacare is not going to give up on taking uh, the fight down if he does decide to stand he has got finishing ability although we don't see it often i like that fight it's a good fight for both guys what do you think eric yeah i mean jacare i've always been a huge fan of his ever since uh you know back in strike force and his earlier fights <clears throat> i was very excited for his uh his ufc debut finally to get him in there and he looked he looked really good. Like he uh, he got that almost plot of sweep from the bottom, rolled Chris over. And what I was really impressed with, it wasn't so much the choke, but his squeezing power. Like how quickly Kamozi went to sleep. Like he didn't tap. And props to Kamozi, you know, he, he's tough as hell. But I mean, he went to sleep quick. His his arms went limp and it was done for. Yeah, that. Um, had, uh, oh, sorry, I was uh, just going to say it looked like a blood choke rather than an oxygen oxygen choke the way his lights went out so quickly definitely i definitely agree uh as for what's next um i'll agree with uh, i'll agree with jay there uh okami and bisbing they both they both seem like a a likely matchup you do have to put him above rockhold but i think preferably i think i would rather see him fight okami just being based on the fact that okami's on a three-fight win streak over um it was Buddy Roberts, and he beat Lombard, and uh, who am I forgetting? Uh, Alan, Alan Belcher. I, I just think that'd be a really interesting fight to see if to see if Jacare can get the stronger, well, probably stronger Okami to the mat and sub him, or will he use his striking that he's been working diligently on to improve? 
Right. One of our listeners has messaged in as, as well about our previous comments about RDA and Dunham. Uh, Eric's fr- uh, friend that he mentioned earlier on, Jaron, he messaged in saying he was one of the few people that actually felt that RDA won. He thought they had better movement, harder punches, and he just felt that Dunham uh, seemed uh, kind of slow compared to uh, RDA. So, Jaron, thanks for your input, mate. Uh, we don't agree with you, but we appreciate you uh, chucking your, t- your 10 pence in. Uh, with whoa, regards whoa, to whoa, we Ray, do agree with him. What are you on about? <laughs> We don't agree with you either, Jay. Mute all. Cheater. So going, back, going back to Jackeray, for me it was a nothing fight because the fight played out exactly how we, we thought it was going to be. You know, you can talk about Kamozi and, and how good he's going to be and uh, um, whatever. I thought Kamozi's last fight was terrible against Nick Ring. It was such a horrible fight to watch. Uh, but uh, this fight, he it, it, it was never in it. I mean, originally Jackeray should have been fighting uh, Philippou. That, for me, was a much better matchup because Philippou has risen from the ashes. So uh, wh- why not put Jacare in against Philippou? If he beats Philippou, that, that for me is a win worth having. The other obvious one is, is throw him in against Vitor Balfour. Balfour's on a hell of a run. He's just beat two top contenders, and it's not just the fact he's beat them, but it's the way he's beat them. And I'm sure Jacare's thinking of, of, of fighting for a title. I'd quite happy to see that as a number one contender match with the winner facing the winner of Silver Weidman. Hmm, yeah, I... I... I think all those make a lot of sense. Jacques Array is easily top 10, if not top 5, in the middleweight class. I like the idea of Yushin Okami and Michael Bisping. Um, I think stylistically, the Yushin Okami fight would be a little more exciting. But just because I dislike Michael Bisping... I, I don't really dislike him, but... But, you know, he loves playing the role of, of the heel. He he really embraces it, and that that would be fun just uh, to see him talk a lot of smack and then get choked out or something. But uh, Plus, I mean, I hate everyone from, from the UK as it is, so that sort of adds to it. Um, Jacare, I, I, I really think we'll, we'll, maybe not this year, but next year, see... Silva or whoever the middleweight champ is take on Jacare. He his his stand up just has looked so crisp, especially in that Derek Brunson fight. That Derek Brunson fight really upped his stock in in my mind because we already know he's got Damian Maya level jits. You don't want to get on the ground with him or you're gonna get choked out, tapped out, whatever the fuck. But when he showed that that against a guy like Derek, Derek Bronson, who fought Lieben to a decision, he fought Lieben for 15 minutes and Lieben couldn't put him out. I believe Jacare put Derek Bronson out in a minute 33 with a with one punch. Um, that was just an incredible. You know, he's he's really starting to dial it up, put it all t- to uh, together, and and honestly, I I think the only people in the middleweight class that would beat him are Belfort, Silva. And I want to say Sonnen, but shit, if you know Sonnen's whole whole game is taking you down and bringing you down, I love Sonnen. He's my second favorite fighter in the world, but I don't know if I'd favor him over Jacare. Jacare is dangerous, and even against Belfort and Silva, those would would be great fights. So very excited to see what Jacare's got to offer and whatnot. Um, we move, we will move on to the uh, main event: Vitor Belfort knocking out Luke Rockhold via a beautiful KO, spinning heel kick and punches about two and a half minutes into the first round. Um, well, like I mentioned on last week's MMA podcast, both of these guys are first round finishers. I think uh, v- Vitor Belfort leads the UFC in first round finishes of. I think like his 12 UFC knockouts, 11 are in the first round. Luke had a very similar record of his eight finishes. Eight were in the first round. So we knew if it wasn't going to the judges, chances were it ended in the first round. And Vitor Belfort pulling out this crazy spinning heel heel kick. And before we talk about the fight, before we talk about what's next for, for either guy, we got to broach the topic of TRT, because going into it, everyone was saying Vitor is going to win because of the TRT, including my myself, I will admit. And even after, they're saying, see, he was in, in Brazil, he was on TRT. Do you think TRT had any influence on, on the fight? Even though I said he would win because of the TRT, that spinning heel kick... TRT had nothing to do with it. Whether he had, you know, zero t- testosterone or 
synthetic testosterone. That technique was flawless. Uh, Eric, how 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 much did TRT come come into play during the fight this past Saturday? Well, I mean, you you have to be completely uh, completely ignorant to think that it didn't play some role in the fight. The thing the thing with TRT, like you said, it yeah, it didn't help him do that kick. Like, I mean, TRT doesn't teach you how to do a spinning hook kick to the face. I mean, not at all. The thing with TRT, like, it helped him put more hours in the gym. It helped him recover from minor injuries that he may have had. It, it helps him not injure as easily. It helps him, you know, just put those hours in practicing that technique. And, like, um, <clears throat> they say that his uh, he's just taking the testosterone to make his – his own testosterone at a normal level. So he's supposedly fighting at a one-to-one ratio, which is, you know, what, you know, any regular guy walking around would be at. Not like, you know, Chel Sonnen, you know, he got popped and his ratio was 14 to one, which is just insanely, insanely huge. But, you know, the, the question again, like, why is he only fighting in Brazil? Because the Nevada State Athletic Commission says that they won't sanction him to use the TRT exemption. So I, you have to think that it had some play, but I still think the outcome would have been the same. I, I don't think Rock, Rockhold is on uh, Belfort's level. Ray? You with us, Ray? Did he drop out yeah. of the call? No, there he is. Yeah. There he is. Uh, I mean, the kick, the kick was absolutely amazing, and I've never seen Vitor Balfour do a kick like that. Uh, I mean, I thought the kick against uh, Bisbin was pretty pretty amazing, and that co- kind of come out of nowhere. He's obviously reinvented himself. I'm sure the TRT is helping him, obviously, as he wouldn't be taking it, and like uh, like Eric said, it's obviously helping him with, with his training and his recovery and things like that. But it doesn't help with technique, and that, that's just the way it is. People always like to bitch whether they win or lose. I like the fact that Luke came out afterwards and said that it wasn't the TRT that he lost to, it was the kick, and I respect him for that. You know, it'd be interesting to see if he's able to fight outside of Brazil because his last few fights have been in Brazil. So I don't know how the rules are with him fighting uh, in where where there's more governed than the US, for example. But uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Balfour is flying up the ranks at the minute, and it's not the fact that he's winning; it's it's how he's winning. That's what's impressing me. I mean, beating Bisping and, and uh, Rockhold is impressive. Beating them the way he beat them is is amazing. He has looked phenomenal. Um, the TRT, I don't see how it plays a massive factor. You can train kickboxing for, I've done it for five years and you can pull off that technique. It's not, the TRT is not gonna, TRT is not gonna, you, you can't just sit down, take TRT and be able to pull stuff like that off. That is pure technique. That is a lot of training, a lot of dedication to the sport. Yes, the TRT will help him in all those gym wars that he goes through. Yes, the TRT will give him the strength and conditioning that he he will need should the fight go something like five rounds. Yes, it will give him power. Yes, it will give him speed. That was just technique. That's what it was. The, the knockout after it, the punches and everything that he swarmed on him, TRT might have played a factor in that um but the way i view trt is more going to benefit the guys like um Dan, not Dan Henderson, Chael Sonnen, you know, grapplers who once they get a hold of you can just use the pure power to pull you down in a striking match where you're going, you know, where it was almost becoming a one punch. We're going to see who whose punch connects and whose drops the other. It's the fight that started turning out to be in about two and a half minutes in. And there we had it, one big punch. I mean, Vitor was on him the whole time during the fight, making sure that he could try and land this one punch. When it finally did land... It was a kick and it was all over. It was an incredible fight. Um, it made up for the appalling spinning back kick earlier in the fight by uh, Roger Roger against Fabio Maldonado that was the spinning back kick directly to the crotch. It made up for that and it was, yeah, it was epic. That's the only way you can describe it. It was pretty goddamn epic. Uh, before we get to the news, a couple more uh, points about Vitor I want to talk about. Uh, the whole TRT thing kind of took a weird turn because a year ago... He he was bashing TRT, saying that guys are more like Formula One race cars now. I believe it was Bel- uh, Belfort who 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 mentioned that, saying that it seems like 
more emphasis is being taken off the fighter or the, or 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 the car if you follow the F1 metaphor and more emphasis is being put on the engineers or the steroids um and he's sort of bought bought into it saying he's he's a T-Rex and he's in a new jungle and he's doing very excellently you know shaven he's he's got got the mohawk going he's got the TRT going things are going well for Vitor Belfort but a but a uh, a I believe a re- reporter for MMA Junkie after the fight asked v- uh, Vitor Belfort about TRT, and Belfort asked to have him beat up, which you know most cases I'll brush it off and say he's joking, like like you know oh someone beat that guy up, but Belfort said it with a pretty straight face on, and when you're in Brazil, I mean. You know these these are the same fans who chant at non Brazilian fighters. You're gonna die. So when a Brazilian fighter says, "Hey, someone beat up this American guy," I tend to think it might be more serious than than you know, say a Frank Mir saying that in America because it's not gonna happen here. But I have a feeling that kind of shit does happen in in Brazil. What what do you take from? Uh, if you, Vitor basically threatening a guy for just asking him about TRT, Eric. Uh, that was actually the uh, the first time I had heard about that, man. That's that's uh that's pretty fucked up. <laughs> I, I hadn't heard anything about that, but uh, I don't know. Maybe uh, does TRT bring you roid rage? I'm not sure. Ray. I think you've made it up, Jake. I think that's the first time I've heard about it as well. Are you making up stories now? Just so we've got something to talk about on the show. Uh, maybe or maybe not. No, I'll I'll actually look up the uh, story now and maybe get a quote start, or two start here. Sending links on the uh, on the sheet so we know what's going on. I'm only joking. It's the first I've heard. Son of a bitch. But yeah, I understand where you're coming from because it's obviously it's not the same kind of laws or ruling. All you need to have done is watch. Uh, is it City of God? You know how dangerous it is in Brazil. Um, yep. I'm uh, sorry. I'm uh, reading the article now. He did go back and apologize, but um, apparently, uh, shit. I'm looking for the. Uh, yep. He. Uh, all right. That that was the scene at the UFC on FX post fight presser where the former UFC champion went back to 90, 1992 and told MMA junkies John Morgan to talk to the hand before threatening to have him physically assaulted for asking about TRT, and I believe the next day he uh, would apologize for those comments. I must admit that I have heard the story before. I don't know, man. The guy is currently riding the two-fight winning streak, but neither of these bouts have been in Las Vegas where, or any American state whereby they've really been sanctioned as we as we would have liked them to be. I know that you get different exemptions by just saying that you're on TRT. Your levels are allowed a little bit higher up. That's I think that's the reason why Sonnen got screwed over because he just didn't announce it or it wasn't recorded that he announced it. I don't know though. It's, TRT is a crazy subject. Um, I don't, I, as as for what happens, eventually he's going to have to fight outside the outside of Brazil. That that much is obvious, especially if he's you know he's on the verge of this title shot now. In order in order for him to eventually fight for the title, I don't think the UFC would let it be in Brazil. Although it would sell probably in terms of seats and gate and stuff, it would sell phenomenally. It would sell like hotcakes to see Silver versus Belfort in Brazil. But Silver wouldn't need to, man. He's fought all over the world. Why not? He doesn't need to fight a trt Belfort. But the TRT situation is interesting. And the journalist story, you can't shake off questions like that. You've got to try to answer everything you're given unless you're Tito Ortiz. Yeah, he uh, pulled <clears throat> pulled out a talk to the hand. I don't know if I've heard anybody say talk to the hand since I was in high school or some shit. So he was pretty immature in many different ways, saying talk to the hand, threatening to get him beat up. Um, and the last topic before we move on to the news and guess that tweet, Vitor Belfort, where does this put him in the hunt for the title shot? If you look at the UFC.com rankings, he's currently number two behind Chris Weidman, so he does look like he is the next in line after Anderson Silva and Chris Weidman. Should Vitor fight again, uh, but 
between now and then because we can pretty safely assume if Vitor wins one more fight, he will get a title shot at 185 against Anderson Silva or Chris Weidman. Um, should should he uh, just wait for for the title shot? Should he fight again? Maybe take on a guy. Um, I don't have have the top guys in front of me, but I believe the top five after Sylvan Weidman. I believe it's Belfort, Philippou. Uh, you got Bisbing and Yushin Okami and Jacare there. Um, obviously, we don't know what Chael Sonnen's going to do next, whether he's going to move down to middleweight or stay at 205. But if he does move back down, he obviously would be in that conversation. Um, where does this put v- <laughs> Vitor, and what's next for him, Eric? Um, yeah, with Vitor, you can't. You there's really no way to argue that he is. Uh, he is at one of the top three best middleweights in the division. Um, but the thing with Vitor, like when asked post fight about you know who he wanted next, and you know if he wanted the title shot, he kind of said everything but yes. Like he said he was rooting for Anderson, but he didn't really say that he wanted that fight. I mean, if that was me, I would want to get back in there and show everybody that I could do better than just getting front kicked in the face. You know, I would want to get that win back or at least, you know, give it hell trying. But, I mean, if he, if he doesn't want the Anderson fight right now, if he wants to take another fight, I mean – there, there's a couple options, I, I suppose. Uh, I don't know about Chael Sonnen. I'm not sure what he's going to do. I, I'm assuming he's going to stay at 205 because, you know, he says he, you know, he'd rather, he would rather be, you know, happy and not have to cut the weight and be, be grumpy all the time. But he said he could be coerced back down for the right price and the right fight. So who knows with Chell. But with Vitor, I mean, if he doesn't want the Anderson fight, I, you know, you could match him up with O'Connor. O'Connor would be an interesting fight. You could match him up with Jacare if, <clears throat> if you wanted to do that for, if you, if he wanted to do that fight. There's a couple options for him. But personally, I would like to see him fight the winner of Anderson and Weidman. Uh, you know, if it's the rematch with Anderson, you know, I'm definitely excited for that fight, you know, to see if, if Vitor can, do better than the first time. And if it's Chris Wadman, that's a completely different fight and also exciting in its own right. Definitely. And really quick, before uh, we get raised two cents, we had somebody tweet into the show. If you want to tweet into the, sh- into the show, you're listening live and you want to have your tweet read on the air, talk about it, uh, tweet us at the MMA podcast. Uh, and our buddy Yao from the MMA podcast, Yao the Truth, tweeted in saying, listen, Vitor will fight anybody they tell him to. Quote, I don't pick fights, I accept fights. Vitor Belfort. Um, <clears throat> so it sounds like Vitor will fight anybody Joe Silva throws at him, whether that be a title shot or for title contendership next. But I don't see him having more than one one more fight before getting that title shot. Uh, Ray? I like that quote as well. I'm, I'm not a... I'm not a matchmaker. I'm a. I'm a it, well, the, the quote just said mine's gone black now. But yeah, I, when he said that, I thought that was a really good line when he pulled that out. <clears throat> I think uh, if Vitor Balfour was to be given a title shot, I don't think you can be too disappointed with it because, like I said earlier on, it's not the fact he's beat the guys; it's how he's beat the guys that's that impresses me. But I don't. I don't. Obviously, there's going to be people out there that are not going to agree with what we're saying. I think most of us are saying that we'd be happy if he got the, the next fight because of what he's doing. But I know um, someone, again, listening, someone's messaging, Wes, of course, who's part of MMA Mentor, he says that Vitor Balfour is a Maradona wannabe injecting crackhead. So maybe we need to get him on the round table in the future. But yeah, I'd be happy to see that fight. But as I said before, uh, Baltor versus Jacare is a good fight as well. I wouldn't mind seeing that fight. Uh, and if that if they did fight, then that should definitely be a number one contendership fight. Jay? Yeah, you guys have brought up some very, very interesting situations. I mean, the whole the whole idea that Vitor Belfort is undefeated in Brazil and he is working his way back to the back to the title is one thing, but who give him next is a difficult question. I'd like to see him fight Kung Lee, especially coming off that back kick KO. I know this is a bit of a crazy one, and maybe Kung Lee hasn't earned the fight with Belfort, but if you look at the division, you've got Mark Munoz, Tim Boach, Belcher, and Lombard all coming off lo- losses. The guys who kind of do deserve it or are in the, you know, they're on wins at least. They, so they could be argued in the, you know, top 
top three. They should be getting a decent guy. It's Philippou, but he doesn't really deserve a Hall of Fame fight yet. So it's either Akami, Souza, or Kung Lee. I mean, I guess you could put Bisping in there, but you won't want to see that rematch. So why not give him Kung Lee? It's, it's a super fight for sure. You've got two guys who can throw spinning back kicks. Of course, Lee would get messed up. But right now, Silva's looking like he might get the... Uh, the super fight so you have a solid number one contender and that is Vitor Belfort especially if if um, Chris Weidman does pull off the upset uh, Vitor Belfort has been beaten by Anderson Silva before so there is no rush to make the fight and it looks like no other man at 185 could beat him so if Anderson Silva did want to take some time out and go make the super fight this is the best time to do it as the division won't come to a freeze and the, the guy won't lose and you've got you've got him either if Weidman or Silva wins you've got him there he's definitely the 185 John Fitch right now but just 185 so it's actually exciting for sure, and that brings us to UF. That brings us to the end of the UFC on FX8 review. And before we get into the news, we got a bunch of breakdown on the news. Going to be talking about Caraway Gate. More stuff coming out on that. Rory dismissing ever fighting GSP. John Cholish blasting fighter pay, and of course Barrow out of UFC 161. Hendo versus Rashad will replace it. We'll get to all those topics. Uh, after guess that tweet. Also, uh, someone else tweeted into the show, um, and for some reason I can't fuck. What? Where the fuck did it go? I, uh, all right. Well, um, I'm not sure where this tweet went, but I'll try and figure it out. <laughs> um, but yeah, Jay is uh, hosting guess that tweet this week. So without any further ado, uh, Jay, it's all you. Host away. Awesome. Well, I've been looking forward to this one. I just, yeah, I didn't know immediately that it was me, but I'm excited as I've had some time to go over some tweets. We've got some good tweets. Oh, I think they're all from this week. So the order this week will be Jake, Eric, and Ray, and then of course we'll swap around each time. So are you all ready for the first one? Let's do it. Brilliant. Right. Tweet number one. I've always worked very, very hard, and the harder I've worked, the luckier I got. So, the guys, of course, this is one of these motivational tweets or whatever. Number one, Josh Koscheck. Number two, Joseph Benavidez. Number three, my boy, Tiago Silva. And number four, Phil Baroni. Um, man, I want to go with Tiago Silva just because I know it's your boy. But uh, Phil, Phil seems... Seems like he'd tweet out something like this, so I'll go with Phil Baroni. Eric, um, I think uh, I think you were trying to throw throw a little bone into the mix there by saying your boy Tiago Silva. So I'm not going to go with him. Uh, I'm going to lean. Uh, doesn't sound quite douchey enough for Josh Koscheck. <laughs> so I'm I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean with uh, I'm going to lean with Jake. I'm going to say Phil Baroni. I was thinking Baroni as well, but I don't want to copy you two. So, what were the first two? Josh Koscheck and... Benavides. I'll go with Benavides. <laughs> well, guys, it was not Josh Koscheck, although he does love his gay tweets. It was not Joseph Benavides. And it was not Phil Baroni. It was my boy, Tiago Silva. Uh, so, uh, point to Jay. Yeah, I'm going to win this. This is going to be crazy. Um, right. Tweet number two. Credit where credit's due. Just saw Victor's KO of Rockhold. Great kick. It was Victor's. That was not a typo by me. It was a typo by them. So was it number one, Michael Bisping? Number two, Tom Watson? Number three, Edson Barboza? Or number four, Uriah Hall? I'm going to go with Tom Watson. Eric, you're up, buddy. Oh, my fault, bud. Uh, I'm going to go Uriah Hall. Alright, so it was uh, Watson, Hall, and who else? Bisping, Bisping and Barboza. Barboza. Um, I'm trying to think. A lot of these Br- Brazilians only tweet in Portuguese. I'm trying to think if I've ever seen... Barboza tweet in English. Actually, 
Yeah, I think. I, yeah, he. Ah, uh, fuck. I. Well, I'm gonna go with with uh, Edson or Bisping because I don't want Jay to get another point. Um, hmm. I'm thinking Bisping. He doesn't tweet much, and I really don't know if he'd compliment a guy that just knocked him the fuck out. Uh, yeah, I'll uh, go with Edson Barbosa, I guess. It was not Uriah Hall. It was not Tom Watson. It was not Edson Barbosa. It was indeed Michael Bispin. So that's me on two points. Alright, um... I... Yeah, I'm pulling up Michael Bisbing's Twitter now, and I don't see this tweet. Are you sure? Oh, wait, nope, there it is. God damn it. Fuck you, Jay. You son of a see, bitch. You cheater. Jake, Jake is cheating right now. He's checking up on tweets, guys. Yeah, I'm cheating. Be- yeah, I'm looking because you're a fucking cheater, and I gotta see this. And if I was cheating, would I have just gotten it wrong? You well, son of a bitch. He did spend a fucking long time going down Edson Barbosa's page to try and find if he ever tweeted in English. No, AJ, uh, you're the one who cheats at this game, so why don't we move to the next one? Well, I'm on two, so you guys had better do a good job. Tweet number I love three. how you're accusing me of cheating when I just, just got it wrong, too. Yeah, that's because you're rubbish at cheating. Anyway, tweet number three, keep grinding. Um, that's it. So, number one, John Fitch. Number two, Rumble Johnson. Number three, Nick Ring. Or number four, Daniel Cormier. Uh, I'm a fan of Cormier. I'll go with him. I'm going to say Rumble Johnson. I'm going to say Rumble Johnson as well. Well, it was not John Fitch. It was not Nick Ring. And it was not Daniel Cormier. It was indeed Rumble Johnson. So, Jake... You, I think you're already falling behind, buddy. Hey, Jay, why don't you go yeah. fuck yourself? Why don't you get something right? Right, anyway. Um, number four. So do I get a prize... This is the tweet. So do I get a prize now that my ex-wife is in jail once again? Three times in six months. Hashtag winning. Hashtag single dad. Hashtag FML. Hashtag have a great day. Number one. Was it Mark Hunt? Or was it Ian McCool? That's number two. Was it Bas Rutan? Or number four, was it Stefan Bonner? I'm going to go for Ian McCall. Yeah, I'll do the same. Ian McCall. Um, I don't think it's Rutan or Bonner. Who was the first one? Hunt or McCool. Yeah, I'm leaning Ian McCall too, but I'll just say Mark Hunt because I don't want to get any points this time around, I guess. That's fair enough, man, and you don't get any points because it was not Mark Hunt, it was not Boss Rutin, and it was not Stefan Bonner. So that's we got two guys and two, and we got another, well, we might have to go to a tiebreaker, but we've got one more in normal time. So, here we go. This is the next one. Every now and then, whilst waiting in long lines, I will let out mooing sounds. People give me weird looks, but I keep mooing on. Was it John Dodson, Pat Barry, Antonio Silva, or Kenny Florian? Wait, is this serious? There's actually a UFC fighter who stands in long lines and makes mooing sounds? Yeah, but if it was Antonio Silva, would you complain about it? No, I don't... Yeah, that's a good... Alright, so it's Silva, Dodson, and who else? Barry or Kenny Florian. Pat Barry. Wow, I don't see... I don't know, I feel like Florian's a little too serious. Um, Dodson or Barry, I could picture doing it. Like... Like you said, Sil- I, uh, Silva does have have a sense of humor from what I've seen. I saw him dressed up as Frankenstein, or yeah, and it was actually a pretty fitting costume. So I'm pretty sure it was Barry or Dodson, and I hope Ray and uh, Eric go with Barry or Dodson just so this stupid motherfucker Jay doesn't get another victory. Um, but like I said... I'm aiming to get zero points, and just just to block Jay from getting that third point, 
I'm going to go with Bigfoot, and I hope you all go with Barry and Dodson. I think I'm actually going to go with Kenny Florian, Jake. Sorry, man. It, it seems like I've, you know, I've you seen a lot of his tweets. He, he, uh, he does tend to post some, you know, some humor every now and then. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Kenny Florian. My first thought was John Dodson because he's a bit he's a bit crazy, so I'm going to go for John Dodson. Let me change mine to Barry then, because my pick is literally only to block Jay from getting a point. So I'm going to go with Pat Barry. Well, it was not John Dodson. It was not Pat Barry. It was indeed Kenny Florian. Well done, Eric, for winning the first ever podcast with the well, victory. Fun. Congratulations, man. Thanks, man. You, uh, you, you have a victory speech lined up? Um, syphilis. That is all. S- syphilis. That is all. And uh, I will go ahead and award the point to Team MMA Mental because Ray did re- recruit you to bring you on the show. Which, uh, actually, you know, I... I wa- it's, it's been a while since I've won. Um, I brought... Team MMA podcast out to a commanding lead. I think at one one point we were winning like 15 to 7, 15 to 8. But MMA Mental, thanks to uh, their steroid champion, Jay Jeans, has brought it very close. It's now 17 to 14. Team MMA, MMA podcast with the, the advantage. Uh, I have 11 wins. Jay has 7 wins, all thanks to steroids. Ramsey's 4, Patrick 3, Ray and Chris with 2. Dave and Eric with one. Rest in peace, Buffalo Dave. And uh, we will be back next week. If Chris is able to, uh, if if Chris sees his shadow, he will be back next week. If he doesn't see his shadow, he's going to go back in a hole for six weeks. And if Chris is unable to make it, I'll host next week's. Um, and that does bring us out, I guess, that tweet, I hate you, Jay, and into the news. Um, we, we talked about it last week, and the only reason I talk about it this week is two more things have popped up since last week we talked about Caraway Gate, Diaz Gate, Fag Gate, whatever you want to call it, Pat Healy stripped of his submission of the night bonus given to Brian Caraway. Brian Caraway says, oh, I'm friends with Pat Healy, but I don't feel bad for him at all, which, you know, if you're friend, like, I felt bad for Pat Healy, and I'm not even friends with him, so don't try and say you're friends with him and you don't feel bad for him. Um, obviously one of these selfish, just self-absorbed motherfuckers. And then he says, yeah, and I hate weed and anybody, and of course I've never done, of course he's never done it. And then Nate Diaz comes out, calls him a fag, taken out of context. He's, he's, uh, fined $20,000 and suspended 90 days. But, uh, recently... All this stuff has uh, come out. Look, I mentioned last week the the reason I started to dislike Brian Caraway. Yeah, I will admit Misha Tate is a babe, and uh, I'm I'm pretty jealous over that. But when he talked about knocking all the teeth down Ronda Rousey's throat and breaking her arm, I don't care if you're joking or not. And 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 me and Jay were actually talking about Caraway last night on uh, Facebook. Jay's like he was joking. Give him a break. I don't care if you're joking. You don't tell a girl you're gonna. And knock all the teeth down her throat. Um, so you know he he was before all this the most hated, irrelevant fighter in the UFC. Now these two latest developments have come out. Uh, Bellator fighter Michelle Old saying that Brian Caraway sold her ex roommate PEDs, and uh, even more damning, Kat Zingano comes out saying that Brian Caraway elbowed her in the head at the UFC on. Uh, I forget where Zingano fought, but um, Z- Zingano claiming that as the Misha Tate uh, caravan of people walked by, Brian Caraway elbowed her in the back of the head, and that uh, Z- Zingano even wheeled around, and Uriah Hall was standing there, uh, apparently, and and Hall said, did that guy just elbow you in the head? We're actually going to have Hall on the MMA podcast soon. We do want to get clarification. We want to figure out who's lying. Um, I tend to think it's this douchebag Brian Caraway, but, you know, 
to be fair, we don't know. There's not not a video of it. Um, a lot of people are questioning Kat Zingano. You know, if you're gonna say something, why why say it now? Personally, it makes sense to me. Maybe she wasn't gonna say anything in the first place, but now that all this stuff's coming out about Kiraway, she so she thinks, why not? This guy elbowed me in the head. I'm not gonna stay quiet for him or Misha. You know, I mean, Misha tried to. And give Kat a, a face full of hand as she pushed off her in the first round. And after that, I stopped being a Misha Tate fan. Because fuck that. Um, so, Caraway Gate, all of this is going down. What is up? What's next with, with this guy is, you know... How how is this changing your opinion of the dude Ray and Jay? I uh, know you all both are uh, supporters of beating women, so you're probably going to side with Brian Caraway. What are your thoughts on all this? I would say I was a supporter of, of beating women. Uh, to be fair, I, I didn't know about the Albert thing till just now. If that is true, uh, and if Nate Diaz gets suspended for calling him a fag, then he should be suspended for Albert or in the back of the head because that's worse. A woman in the back of the head. Yeah, it's worse than calling somebody a fag. So it'd be interesting to see what Uri Hall's take on it if you get him on the show. If he if he saw that, I'd like to hear what he had to say about it. Jay, man, I, I really this is such an interesting debate. I think the UFC has got a chance because let's be honest, nobody gives a shit about any of these guys in the bantamweight division outside of Cruz and Barrow. I mean, people aren't even talking about Cruz. Whenever, whenever you even hear the word Cruz, it's injury related to it. Barrow, his name is now going to be down as injured. So nobody cares about this bantamweight division except for maybe Uriah Faber. He might care just because he fights in it. But what the hell? This guy is getting more promotion single-handedly than anybody else in the division. Um, I don't know what's wrong with him. Clearly, he does have some issues not quite right in the head. He might be socially a little bit lacking in terms of social skills because, I mean, he might not just be able to take a joke. I mean, the Rousey thing was interesting. The whole uh, Nate Diaz calling him a faggot or whatever for taking the money, that if if my job was going to offer me 65000 because somebody else is breaking the rules, that's fine. I'll happily take it. The whole elbow situation seems a joke on the behalf of Katz and Garno and Camp. They seem like they're just making the chance to be popular and get their name back in the headlines since she hasn't been in it in a, for a while. The Rousey thing... I don't know why he tweeted that. If I were, if somebody was messing with my missus or whatever, I'd say, yeah, good luck if you want to try and fight me. He obviously took it a step further. I don't know what's going on with the whole situation, but all I know is that Caraway's going to win his next fight just purely on the basis of promotion for the UFC. Everybody wants to see this guy get knocked out. So why not make him a big thing? Why not make him a big deal and get people to pay to see him get knocked out? You know, let him have a couple more wins. Let even more marketing get bad on this guy so everybody's calling him a fucking whatever the hell and yeah then have him knocked out but right now he is hot he's the most popular guy well not popular he's the most well-known guy in the bantamweight division who's currently active and yeah that's the reality of it eric yeah i'll uh i'll agree with some of the stuff that jay was saying there i mean the way they say any publicity it's good publicity i mean you take uh Chel Sonnen, for example, people love him, people hate him, but still they pay to see him. They pay to see him either beat somebody down or they pay to see him hopefully get knocked out. Same with like, uh, like T. Ortiz, you know, uh, so Caraway's definitely putting his name out there. And like, like Jay said, like he's, he's the hot topic right now. So, uh, they can definitely sell some, sell some tickets off, off of him. You know, people want to see him get knocked out. Um, as far as the Rousey thing, I definitely think he went way, way overboard with that. I mean, you, you don't have to go that deep into detail with, with shit like that. I mean, I take it like how, like when George St. Pierre and Ronda Rousey got into it. George replied smirkingly and made Rousey look like a, a complete loudmouth. Like you can do that and make her look stupid, but you don't got to say you're going to knock her teeth down her throat and break her arm or this and that. I mean, that's, that's way overboard. With the uh, the Nate Diaz thing, I can kind of understand why they um, why they find him. I mean, with Dana White getting in trouble over the video he posted about saying faggot and calling the uh, the sure dog uh, 
lady a cunt or whatever. Uh, they they kind of have to uh, keep up appearances, you know, make people, you know, make it look like, you know, we don't tolerate this stuff. But I expect uh, Nate probably, you know, he, he got fined, but I expect his suspension to be a lot like the Matt Mitrion suspension, which they said, yeah, we're going to suspend him indefinitely until, you know, further notice. But then he was back and has a fight signed, you know, in like a week or two. So, I mean, I can see why they did it, but I think the uh, I think the $20,000 Fine with a little, a little off. But hell, I mean, you can't blame Caraway for taking the money. I mean, anybody in their right mind would have taken the money. I, I know Nate Diaz would have, you know, taken that sixty-five thousand dollars and said, you know, fuck you to Pat Haley. But I mean, he didn't have to be such a dickhead about it. And I know, I don't know if you guys have seen it. I know Ray has seen it, but I uh, made quite a few posts about it on the uh, the MMA troll. You know, go check those out. But yeah, I mean, that's my opinion. Yeah, um, we actually just got another tweet from our boy Yao the Truth saying, you guys want to see Brian Caraway get knocked out, I'm your guy. And he does fight at, at a Bantamweight, or I actually think he fights at Featherweight now, our uh, buddy Yao, but if he does move down, he would be at Brian Caraway's class. Our boy Yao is coming up the ranks after Grappler's Quest, who knows, Brian Caraway will get cut from the UFC, Yao will be making his way up the minor promotions, and we might see our boy Yao the truth knock all the teeth down Brian Caraway's throat for a change. Um, I do agree with 99% of what, 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 uh, you, you said, Eric. A lot of real salient points there. Except for the fact, I don't know if I agree with any publicity being good pu- publicity. Because Sonnen, when, when Sonnen says this in, in inflammatory shit, it makes a lot of people laugh. It puts a lot of people on his side. I mean, when Sonnen says ridiculous shit, myself and most people I know read it and smile. All of us have gone on you YouTube and looked up these hilarious son and rants. Caraway, I don't know if anybody is reading this story, becoming a bigger fan of him. You know, whether and like it's it's all like him being negative about something, like him 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 saying, you know, people who do weed are druggies. Well, I don't see him gaining any positive support from that. Then him. El- elbowing Cat Zingano in the head and saying he didn't. I don't think anyone's drawing any positive su- uh, support from that. Him being accused of selling PEDs. Him saying he's going to knock Ronda Rousey's teeth down her throat. This is like the Michael Richards sort of thing. You know, when Michael Richards called all all those people in in words um, in uh, I believe it was the Comedy Cellar in. Uh, L- or not, not, not the comedy seller. The com- I don't even know, but not all publicity is good publicity. Brian Caraway is getting a bunch of negative flack off of this, and I want to see our boy Yao when he gets done tearing Mikey Ricci to shreds. I want to see him knock the piss out of Brian Caraway. Um, <clears throat> all right, moving on. We got uh, Rory McDonald dismissing that he'll ever fight George St. Pierre. Should teammates fight each other? Simple enough, Jay. It's a very interesting one. I mean, for a while we've had the whole cost check debate. The cost check. Uh, you got to mute up, Jake, buddy. Oh shit, my uh, bad. <laughs> uh, it's a very interesting. You've got cost check and Fitch. You never ever needed to fight, and then you've had guys who have come on the TUF show like BJ Ferguson. I can't remember his brother, but they were like, "Yeah, we'll fight each other. Whatever, man. That's the way the competition goes." And they said they'd fight whenever. Rory fighting GSP. I don't think the fight will happen. Maybe if they eventually broke camps. You've had other guys like Rashad and Jones. You've had Condit versus GSP. Some camps, people will eventually say, look, we need to have this fight. I mean, Melvin Gillard and Cerrone, although it looked like a crazy work, yeah, it did happen. But I just think uh, Rory... He doesn't want to fight GSP. Right now, it doesn't need to happen. Rory can be the Vitor Belfort, the John Fitch of the division. He can hang at number two. He's not there right now, but he can eventually get there if he keeps working on his game. And yeah, we'll just see see how things go. But not t- teammates don't always have to fight. You've also got Cormier versus Kane, who don't look like they want to fight either. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Um, they don't always, like, there's always uh, ways around it. But if it comes down to where they're the number one and the number two guys in the division, I think they should, you know, put their friendship aside for 15 or 25 minutes 
you know, whichever. And, you know, just, just go to war. I mean, you can still be friends afterwards. And like, uh, like Jay said, you know, if, you know, the camp ever split, like if somebody went a separate way, they should definitely, you know, fight or, um, like with Condit and GSP, that, that's kind of a different scenario because they have trained together, but most of the time, GSP is in uh, TriStar in Canada. Condit bases most of his training camp out of Team Jackson in Albuquerque. I mean, they have trained together, but they, they're they not really together together like the way Rory and GSP train together, I'm assuming, is like every day at TriStar. <clears throat> but, yeah, if it ever came down to it, I think Rory and GSP should fight. Like if Rory does get to that number two spot and, you know, is holding it, you know, strongly, they, they, should, they should go at it. It's a really tricky one. We've had this conversation before. We've had it. I always remember wanting to see Koscheck versus Fitch, and of course that never happened. I mean, really, if they're in the same weight class and they're matched together, and the fight makes sense, they should really fight. If they're number one and two, they should definitely fight. And uh, Wes messaged me and says, if they're number one and two and they don't fight, they should be stripped of the belt. And yes, and I can see the argument for that as well. At the end of the day, the champion should fight the number one contender. We've, we've had recently where we've had champions picking their fights, and we've seen it with GSP picking Nick Diaz, and that's left us not getting to see GSP Hendricks, which is what we should have seen ages ago. A champion should fight whoever the number one contender is, regardless of where they train, whether they who they want to fight. You know, So if Roy McDonald works his way up to the number one contender, which I'm sure he will one day, because he is a brilliant fighter, then GSP and, and McDonald should fight. If McDonald doesn't want to fight for the title, then you have to wonder... What's he doing? Maybe he knows Jesse's going to retire soon. He'll wait for him to go, and then he'll go after the title. Yeah, that's uh, also a, a a pretty good thought. Um, man, I am crossed on it. I was saying last night, I I don't think teammates should shy down from fighting one another. This does work out because with GSP being so much older than Rory, he sort of can pass the torch along. But I think that. You know, we're seeing more and more of these giant camps. Camps like Alpha Male, Jacksons, a.k.a. Black Zillions. I mean, you have a huge amount of fighters belonging to those four main camps. You have other ones, you, you know, you have TriStar, you have the Sarah Camp in New Jersey, etc., etc., etc. But these, these camps are getting more and more elite fighters, and more and bigger percentages are being in these camps. And I just hate, you know... Look, I do see the the argument against it that you don't want guys to be hiding things from teammates in their own camp just because there's the possibility that they fight down the line. And I do think that teammates should not fight unless it's for a title or unless it's for title contendership. But you know, we've we've seen it negatively in. Uh, impact the sport things like Fitch and Koscheck they both I mean not fighting one another probably hurt both of their careers um Yao sending us a blank text or a blank tweet solid uh yeah just I I am kind of cross on it but in the long run if if these teams are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger you're not going to be able to avoid that some of the best guys in certain classes like for example GSP and Rory are going to be fit, uh training in in the same camp and might need to fight one another um who's who's going first on this yeah 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 sorry uh John Cholish, uh, the uh, next topic, blasting fighter pay, retiring, saying that the UFC is not giving their lower guys enough money. I'm not sure what the exact number Cholish made was, but I believe it was around five or ten thousand dollars for fighting on the Facebook card. He's one of these Wall Wall Street guys, thinks that he should be getting more money, and this is you know sort of like the last topic. I can see both sides of it. The UFC makes between five and ten mil million dollars, if not more. Per event, I'm not sure what the profit is. They are a privately held company, so they aren't aren't releasing uh, lots of their financials. But it is safe safe to say that five to ten million dollars would be on the low end of what they make per event. They're probably annually making up into the billions of profit. Um, so the arg- argument is, you know, is it you know, is it fair if you're making millions of dollars per event to pay these guys on the Facebook cards 
five or ten thousand dollars, you can look at it that way, or you 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 can look at it. Is anybody you know what what added bonus is John Cholish bringing to this UFC card? If John Cholish was on it or was off it, would the numbers change at all? Would the gate be any different? Would the pay per view buy rate be any different? Probably not. So there are both of those are. Arguments, obviously, the Fertitas and Dana White being on one side, Cholish being on the other. Does John Cholish have a point? Are these lower tier guys getting paid uh, not enough? Uh, Eric, uh, I'm with you, Jake. I can I can both agree and disagree on points that Cholish made. I believe his actual payout for uh, UFC on FX8, I believe it was eight thousand, eight thousand to show, eight thousand to win. So he, he came out making $8,000, and his camp, I believe, or him or his camp one, uh, made a statement about uh, it take, like they're flying to Brazil, getting the medicals, getting the visa, and all of that combined, you know, flying his team to Brazil with him to corner him and all that is, you know, in between five and $10,000. So he either just broke even or he had to, like, he lost money, you know, because he lost. I mean, you can you can see you can see a reason for that. I think the I think the UFC should at least cover, you know. I mean, not not pay for these fighters to do this, but you know, their win percentage and show percentage, I think, should at least cover their expenses for you know the training camp or uh, you know flying and getting visas and medicals and all that stuff. But you know, like you said, I don't think it's gonna. You know, I definitely don't think it's gonna make a difference. I don't think Dana White. You know, I don't think it's gonna make a difference. You know, him coming out and publicly stating this. And, um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's going to make a difference at all. I mean, other fighters have done it before in the past saying that they didn't get paid enough. I mean, Rampage has always said it. Nick Diaz has said that he don't get paid or he should get paid. But, you know, either way, I don't think it makes it, it makes a difference. But I think they, sh- they could get paid just a little bit more. That's my opinion. I kind of see it from the other perspective, from the UFC perspective. At the end of the day, he's complaining about getting paid $8,000. There's no other promotion that's going to pay John Cholish $8,000. And what value did he add to that card? You talk about, uh, you know, adding money to the gate or whatever. Okay, people aren't going to buy extra tickets to see his fight. But not only that, but even after the fight, you don't want to go back and watch, re-watch that fight again. I mean, there's fights on that card, I, I would go back and re-watch again. That fight that John Cholish put on, it wasn't a great fight. I mean, he was easily beat by, by Gleason Tebow. He was obviously overly matched. Uh, Tebow was way, way too good for him. Uh, John Cholish is one of those guys I didn't really know too much about going in. I don't know too much about him now. If he didn't fight in the UFC again, I wouldn't be too disappointed. Obviously, now he's saying he's retired. At the end of the day, you get what you're worth. You, you, if you want more money, you've got to you've got to get yourself more money. If your if your outgoings are matching what you've coming in, reduce your outgoings. Don't take as many people over with you. Don't go over for as long. Don't fight on cards in Brazil. Fight on cards that are local so that it doesn't cost you as much to get to. There's other ways around it. Also, he's talking about uh, his wage. If he's only got wage and that's it, that's all he's got from the event, then he's not being managed properly because he should be getting sponsorship. And that should be covering his flights, should be covering uh, should be covering uh, the other things he's, he's got going on. You know, his gear. He won't pay for his gear. It should be given to him because it's, it'll have a name on because he's on the UFC. If he's not getting that, then he's not being managed properly. And if he's at Wall Street anyway, he's not short of a bobble too, is he, to be fair? Yeah, and uh, Jay, before you jump in, we actually had Chris Lowe, t- our uh, buddy on Twitter, at C. Lowenstein, tweet us something very interesting that I had no idea about. I was actually about to go on a rant about how uh, guys guys like, like Cholish, if they want to make money, they've got to show off their talents. You know, you have two current champions, Benson Henderson and John Jones, who joined the UFC as late replacements, making probably virtually zero money. And by virtue of their skills, they worked their way up and uh, were able to start making millions. Props to Mike Hammersmith, who, who posted a pretty long post on Facebook that I pulled pulled that from. Um, brought up a few interesting points. But our friend Chris Lowe just tweeted us, um, Via Cholish on the MMA Hour, after all costs, he lost $10,000. He had to end up shelling out $10,000 because it costs a lot of money to be an MMA fighter, paying for training, traveling, etc., etc., etc. If it did really end up that John Cholish had lost money, 
yeah, the UFC does give a lot of guys bonuses, even outside of the of of the night bonuses. They will give out locker room bonuses if you put forth an exciting fight. But to have any fighter lose money, that's a cro- that that is a straight up crock of shit. The guy, as Ray said, he's a stockbroker. He's got plenty of money in the bank. Um, he wanted to do this for fun, as far as I'm aware. He trains out of Henzo Gracie Academy, so he's clearly fighting at a top team. He went um, he, he went eight and one in his first fights, but it interest with in his what sixth professional fight, he went to strike force. So instantly, whenever you go to these organizations and you're not a top tier top fighter, you are running the risk of you know you're going to be fighting top tier guys. You're not going to be making a ton of money because nobody really knows your name. Yeah, he won his first UFC bout. That was incredible and everything. But come on, like you've got to expect. You can't. You don't have to accept every fight. A fight with Gleason Tebow is always going to be a mistake. Except in the fight in Brazil, you could say, "Look, I'm not really getting paid enough." You could have just told the company, "Look, I lost ten thousand pound when I lost to Danny Castillo." You can always change camps. You can move to go somewhere cheaper. The guy's made his own mistakes in this organization. And, um, yeah, the fighter pay isn't the best, but there are other ways around that. You know, you can apply for TUF where you get more money. But the guy's fighting out of a top camp, fighting on a low salary. Nobody knows who he is. He's accepting dumb fights. Come on, dude. There are other ways around this. Uh, that's... You even lost by what? Uh, but how? Guillotine. But how can you justify a fighter losing money? I mean, if the UFC is making millions of dollars, and it isn't like you have two hundred fighters on each card, you only have what? It was five, four, and three, so that's a total of what? Twelve fights, twenty-four so, fighters. So you only have tw- fight on that card. All right, so you have a total of twenty-six fighters. If you're making millions of dollars on each card how can you justify any fighter ever losing money that's that that is so crooked well this i i understand that that's a bit of a joke but the guy is fighting out of henzo gracie's academy and there are other cheaper places to to fight out of you know th- that's all i gotta say i you know i'm you know i mean you it's it is a very very sort of tangled web and and we don't know the complications like for instance if you look at the fighter payroll for UFC 159 it tells you that Chick Congo made $70,000 Chael Sonnen made $50,000 if you really think Chael Sonnen left with less money in his pocket than Chick Congo you're out of your mind um, so a lot of this is under the table a lot of this we don't know about just i it's it you know it's a tangled tangled web and it's like trt like weed it seems to just get more and more tangled more and more complicated more and more construed um so we'll just leave it at that and we actually I'm had sorry, sorry. going back yeah. to what you're saying about john and about him losing money it's not up to the ufc to manage his his finances and his bills if you're making five thousand pounds on a job you don't spend ten thousand to do that job You'll make sure that you're going to come out and make your own little bit of profit, regardless of what that is. John needs to manage himself better or get managed better. He shouldn't be losing 10 grand on an event. There's other fighters out there that probably got paid less than John and didn't lose the money that he lost. So that's not down to the UFC. That's down to him not managing himself or not being managed properly. That's what I think anyway. But if top, but but if like all right, we we all will agree that that the UFC is the top level of MMA, and all the fighters in the UFC are at the top of MMA. I want the UFC fighters to be training as with the most elite people they they can, and for for a fighter in like that would. That would be as silly as 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 you know saying Peyton Manning, pro elite fo- football player, he can't train with the best guys because he doesn't make enough money. I mean, if the UFC really wants to put the best product out there, then they should be be paying their fighters enough to be getting the best training. That that makes total sense. I mean, the what what the UFC pays should cover top flight training. Because if you're going to be in the UFC, you're obviously one of the top guys in in the world, and what the UFC pays you shouldn't just be enough to 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 buy you a, a gym membership at LA Fitness. 
and we will move on. Um, actually, our buddy Wes, I I uh, missed his uh, message. Uh, he he s- sent a message in when we were talking about teammates fighting each other, saying that Anderson Silva versus Machida, how good would that be? But we've been robbed because they are pussies. Take the belts. Uh, and I don't know if I am that extreme on it, but that would have been an amazing fight, and that's a fight we'll never see because they're teammates. Uh, Can I last... just drop in one point here? I mean, we yeah. mentioned the, the Henzo Gracie Academy and all this. The guy lost by arm in guillotine to Gleason Tebow. If he's training at the Gracie Academy, surely they would have... Surely he would have practiced guillotine chokes. I mean, he's supposed to be a jiu-jitsu guy. You can't get caught in chokes. What are you doing? You're not a real what are you fighter. Doing, what are you doing losing a fight? I mean, I would argue he should be training at Henzo's because he needs to get better. Not everybody is Jacare Souza, dude. Yeah, but come on, man. You can't lose by arm in guillotine. That is level one day stuff. If you go to any pro, semi-pro event, there are guys tapping out to guillotines all over the place. It's an arm in. It's not even a full one. Fuck this dude. And I would say that that honestly is a point toward the argument I'm trying to make. Because if you're losing via arm and guillotine, then you really need to up your jits. And if you really need to up up your jits, what is the smart thing to do? Get a get a twenty dollar a month pass to LA Fitness or train at the Hen- Henzo Gracie Academy? You know, I I I don't think it's a reflection of him training bad. I think it's a reflection of him being green in the sport. And him needing to up his ju- jujitsu, and maybe if he got paid a little bit more, then he could not retire and stay in the sport and learn more jits. But instead, he can't afford it because the UFC is not paying him 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 enough. I mean, look, I don't feel that bad for for the guy. He's he's on Wall Street, whatever the fuck that means. He's a day day trader, a stock trader, or some shit. Just uh, you. You you can't point to a guy losing by sub and be like, see, he was worthless anyway. Because the UFC has, has got to think of their guys like investments. And they want these investments to grow and get better. And if you're only going to be paying them, I, yeah, we, we are going to have dynamos and prodigies like your John Jones, like your Bensons, who, who, who can handle getting paid jack shit at first because they have the skills to move on, move themselves up the rank, move themselves into a main card. But that's not everybody. Not everybody's... In, in fact, almost nobody is going to be able to get into the UFC and crack the top 10 of your, your uh, weight, <coughs> weight class. But... To not pay a guy enough money to do the things he needs to do to be an elite level fighter, that is a crime. I don't care how how you word it, that is just not cool with, with uh, me. Um, man, and... Uh, moving on, Henan Barrow pulls out due to to injury, and that is one one thing I will give the UFC credit on the fighter insurance thing. That is awesome that that they've started to to cover fighters' uh, medical expenses because that is another thing you could have put in the same category. The UFC being cheap, they used to not pay for their guys' medical bills, but now they do. It's a good thing. Henan Barrow injured; he's not going to be fighting Wineland uh, at UFC 161 instead. Scheduled in their spot at, on the main card, Dan Henderson taking on Rashad Evans at light heavyweight. Both guys looking for redemption. Rashad coming off a loss to Little Nog. Dan coming off a loss to Lyoto Machida. What are your early thoughts on this fight, Ray? I think it's a good fight, but the main event is, of, and you know how all of us on the show love bantamweight, so the main event of Hen and Brow, Eddie Wineland for me is a big loss off the card. Eddie Wine has been on a hell of a run, and of course, Helen Brown's been on a hell of a run. And I was obviously there live for Helen Brown's last fight against Michael McDonald, so I think that's a real shame. Um, Hendo Rashad, yeah, it's an interesting fight. Rashad's last fight was awful against Little Nog, so hopefully he's sorted his head out and he's going to actually come back and fight this time. Hendo's fight, last fight against Machida wasn't the best to watch either. Uh, I'm leaning towards Hendo, but it's a really close fight. Um, man, this is, as I said to Ray earlier, uh, no, not Ray, Jake earlier, if there was ever a chance to fight Rashad Evans, if you're Dan Henderson, it would be now. There might be better times, you know, Rashad Evans. Uh, is everybody else there? Jay just dropped out of the call. I'm still here. I'm here. 
All right, whoa, well... Whoa, I was yeah. talking to my mute button, wasn't I? You were. Oh, okay. Sorry, guys. Uh, Get it together, but... cocksucker. Yeah, exactly, whatever. Um, as I was saying to Jake earlier before we started the show, um, basically there is never a better time to fight Rashad Evans than right now. He's got a brand new wrestling coach who only came in about six weeks ago. Before that, he hasn't had a wrestling coach for 10 months. This guy's wrestling is pretty much out the window. There really isn't a better time to fight Rashad Evans other than when he's in the back of the ambulance after fighting Leroy to Machida. That would have been another good time. But the Black Zillions have no real wrestling right now, so Rashad Evans is going to struggle to bring this fight to the down. Just look at that little Nog fight, man. He he forgot what to do when he's in there without his wrestling. This is Henderson's chance. This is going to be a coming out party for Henderson. Rashad's going to try a takedown, but Henderson's been, you know, he's been working wrestling for so long. He has never stopped doing that stuff. Rashad stopped it for the last 10 months, as I just said. He's only starting to pick this back up. This is his chance. Hendo is going to knock his head out the park. I'm looking forward to it, but I'm, yeah. This is this is better than the boring fight that Burrell versus Wyndham was going to be, in my opinion, anyway. Well, I'll have to go and disagree with you there, Jay. I thought Burrell and Wyndham was going to be a pretty interesting – I mean, not so much interesting as in competitive, but as in how is Burrell going to finish Eddie Wyndham. And I'm also a fan of the, ban- the bantamweight division. I'm not sure if, uh, if they're seeking a replacement to fight Wyndham on the main card or not. If so, I wouldn't mind to see. I don't know what Michael Mayday McDonald's doing right now, but I think that would be a pretty a pretty cool matchup to make. <clears throat> but for Hendo Rashad, I'm really I'm really iffy on uh, who I want to go with. Rashad did look like shit in his last fight against Little Nog. He just really really hesitant. Just did not know what to do. Hendo as well. I mean, didn't look great against Machida, but. Not many people do, other you know, outside of like Shogun and John Jones. But uh, I'm probably leaning Hendo in this one. Uh, I'm hoping for a knockout. I think Rashad's time has probably passed him. He he's continually continually looking uh, less like continually looking worse and worse each fight, in my opinion. So yeah, probably Hendo. I'm gonna say uh, second round knockout for sure. Yeah. Um. I I am not a big fan of this this fight. Whoa, and Ray hasn't spoken, has he? Um, yeah, he let off. I yeah, believe. he went before you did. Oh, you oh, son man. of a bitch! What's thank thank you for uh, interrupting me, though. <laughs> you know, I actually was uh, gonna say say something. I'm pretty sure uh, Jay is from where in England? Where are you from? I'm from the southern England. Southern England. I'm pretty sure in southern England, the word exciting actually means boring, and the word boring actually means exciting, because he said that Burrell Wineland was going to be boring, yet uh, when the Henderson-Machita fight went down, he said that fight was exciting. So I'm 99% sure they just have those words flip-flopped in southern England. But this this is, this is has the potential... Like, it could be decent, but I'm pretty sure this fight's going to be horrible. I mean, look at these these guys' last two fights. Dan looked unmotivated as hell against Lyoto. Rashad looked the same against Little Nog. I have a feeling they're they're going to go out. We're going to see a glorified sparring match. We're not going to see much wrestling, and and I think will um I I think Rashad will win the judges nod. But either way, I'm I'm not sure who will win, but I'm pretty sure this is just going to be a boring tilt. Um, I'm already booing the fight. Boo! This fight's going to be a stinker, I can guarantee you. Um, we will get now to the bonehead of the week before we break down UFC 160. Um, I guess I'll uh, cue up the music unless anyone has anything to add on... Uh, oh, shit, Wes just sent... Sent me a message saying, South Eagle. Wait, oh, it said, don't call that, that out at the end, so I'm not gonna say that. I'm glad I read that last part before I said it. Um, anyone have any thoughts on Hendo Rashad before we move on? The fuck? Bonehead. Yeah, I would, yeah, I should probably be, be the bonehead for that, uh, that last bit of waffling I just did, Wes. Wes, you can't be sending me messages to read on there, and then at the end of it say, "Don't read the shit on air, you cocksucker." Get it together, cocksuckers. All right, bonehead of the week. Enough fucking waffling around. Let's do it. Bum, 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 bum. 
All right, my bonehead of the week this week. Uh, I was going to pick Brian Caraway, but another one of our panelists has chosen Brian Caraway for me, so I don't have to pick Brian Caraway, even though I do want to pick that sick motherfucker. I'm actually going to name uh, KJ Noons as my, my bonehead of the week, saying Donald Cerrone won't stand with him. Uh, we will be breaking down Cerrone Noons in a little bit, but for Noons to be talking any kind of shit going into this fight, especially to a guy who's just as good as stand-up as Noons, it's not not like Noons has this giant stand-up ad- advantage saying Cerrone won't stand with him. Look, since, like, I think in his last ten fights, Cerrone's only lost to Nate Diaz and Anthony Pettis. KJ Noons is nowhere at the level of Diaz and Pettis. On the other hand, you look at uh, Noons' record. Noons has lost four of five. Uh, it's about to be five of six. Donald Cerrone is going to put him away easily. Maybe standing, maybe on the mat. I don't know. But Noons has absolutely zero right to be talking any kind of shit before this fight. Um, my bonehead is actually a very weird one. It is a noob doctor from Brazil. If the, if the guys who haven't heard this news story, it's not really much of a news story, but basically Nick Lentz won his fight against uh, Hacker and Diaz, which was a was a big, big deal. But anyway, so when he got backstage, he's all proud and everything. They needed to cut the gloves off. So this noob doctor comes over, says, okay, I'm going to cut the gloves off, and he manages to completely fuck up Nick, uh, Nick Lentz's hand. There's blood all over it, cuts everywhere. But who gave scissors to this doctor? It's clearly a Hakran DS fan who's pissed off over the fact Hakran lost. I can't believe it. I'm sure Nick Lentz, Nick Lentz couldn't believe it. I think he even tweeted something like, I could have done a better job myself with the picture embedded in it. Just who the hell let this doctor in there? I mean, clearly... I've just got to make sure that those uh, scissors weren't poison tipped or something, because that could be serious. You know, you never know when somebody's got AIDS in the bottom of a pair of scissors or some shit. That is real dodgy. Bad job by the doctors. Don't trust Brazilian doctors. Just don't go to Brazil. Pulling a chail son and damn. My bonehead is uh, a bit more straightforward than that. I'm going to pick the three judges that scored the RDA Dunham fight 29-28 for RDA. Uh, the commentators, oh, uh, Kenny Florin at least thought Dunham had won. I thought Dunham had won. A few people I've spoke to agreed. So for Robin Dunham again, I'm picking those three judges as my bonehead. And that leaves me. I'm unfortunately the guy that Jake was referencing. Uh, sorry, Jake. Uh, first come, first serve. Brian Carraway is my bonehead pick. Just The dude is just not smart. You know, not smart at all with his choice of words. And the way he uh, describes things, going on about the whole, you know, bullshit we've already discussed, you know, discussed it. But yeah, he's my bonehead of the week. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy, and I agree. Caraway, you're my bonehead of the week. You get my vote. Um, that means I'm up. Um, I don't agree with any of these boneheads. I think Caraway is just whatever. Right. I guess I'll go with Ray for RDA versus Dunham. I think. It was close, but man, whatever. This uh, Ray, you got my you got my vote, buddy. I'm going to vote for the uh, just so Eric knows we, we can only vote for ones that we didn't pick. So I'm going to vote for the doctor who cut Nick Lentz's hand. I mean, I think he caused more damage to Nick Lentz than what Hakran Diaz did. So yeah, the doctor for pulls it up there. Who's your bonehead, Eric? Um. I guess I'll go. I'll go with, uh, with Jay about the uh, the Nick Lentz doctor. I mean that guy. You know, how, had to obviously either been a Brazilian fan, a fan of Hakran Diaz, or something like that. Because I mean, that, how could you you know be doing that as your profession and then completely you know just fuck somebody's hand up like that? I mean, he has he had to fly back to the states and. As far as I know, he, he has to get stitches over it. I mean, that's, that's pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty fucked up. And uh, I wasn't keeping count, so Ray, who who won this uh, round of Bonehead of the Week? I was uh, busy throwing internet... Hey, 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 hey! I'm not done talking yet, cocksucker. I was busy throwing insults over it. Hey, 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 hey,
I was throwing internet insults at Eric via the Skype chat because he stole my pick of Brian Caraway. That motherfucker. All right, go ahead, Ray. The Doctor would put it in Nick Lentz's hand. He got two votes. He is the bonehead of the week. All right, and that is the bonehead of the week. Our buddy Wes now saying that I should read what he said on air, and he said the South equals shandy drinking puffs, lager watered down with lemonade with an umbrella in. Uh, damn, Southern sandy drinking puffs, Ray. So in, in Nate Diaz's word, that means they're a fa- they're all fags. Yeah, for for those listening in the U.S., puff means uh, means homosexual. So, uh, Jay, we've uh, got Wes throwing out barbs at the South. What do you got to say about that? I don't, don't really have much to say. I'd like to point out I did emigrate to Wales because the English are all, the English don't know what they're on about. They don't know what they're on about. And I got to side with Jay at least a little bit because at least for now, I also live in the South, not the South UK, but the dirty South in the USA, the Southeast, living in Florida. Eric can side with with me we're living in the south the dirty south doing it dirty as always uh bringing us to ufc 160 this saturday a couple of heavyweights on the main and co-main event there's going to be a lot of reshuffling in the top five of the heavyweight class um we'll start it off with the prelims though of all the prelims i'm looking at it now you do have quite a few decent fights um, and of course, Wikipedia takes forever to load. The one time you really need to pull up and look at the fights. Alright, you got Mike Pyle taking on Rick Story, Bermudez and Holloway, Colton Smith versus Robert Whitaker, Khabib Nurgamadoff versus Abel Trujillo, Stephen Thompson and Nashawn Burrell, Brian Bowles and George Roop, Jeremy Stevens and Estevan Payon. Personally, I think all those aren't maybe not crazy toward one fighter, but I think these are all one-sided fights. I think Pyle Bermudez, Smith, Nurmagomedov, Madoff, Thompson, Bulls, and Stevens all cruise to pretty simple victories. Uh, which fight excites you the most on the prelim? Whoever the fuck's talking first, because I accidentally closed out the run sheet. It's me first. I actually like all of these prelims. I think uh, every prelim fight I'm looking forward to seeing but the one I'm picking is my one that I'm most excited about. I actually disagree as well with what you're saying about the one-sided things. I think some of these fights are pretty pretty competitive, personally. Uh, I think Mike Pyle, Rick Story, is very competitive. Uh, but the fight I'm most excited about is uh, Khabib Nurga made of, and you know it has to be that fight for me to actually say that name, versus Abel Trujillo. I mean, Khabib's looked like an absolute beast, and of course he knocked out Tavares uh, in devastating fashion. And Abel Trujillo's debut, that was one of the best lightweight debuts I've seen in a long time. You know, including the debut uh, from Kabalov, who suplexed that guy, or who suplexed Vince Pichel right down to hell, as they say. But yeah, Abel really impressed me in his debut, and we actually had him on the MMA Mental Podcast shortly after that. And I can't wait to see him. I actually think he, he can get the upset in this fight. I think it's going to be an amazing fight. I can't wait for this card. This is on paper one of the best best events in in a long time. I think UFC 158 was pretty good, but this just looks awesome. I mean, despite the squash match main event, I mean, there is no way. I still can't believe people have somehow even believing that Bigfoot has deserved this fight, but whatever. Then you've got the co-main event. You've got two just guys who like to go in there and bang. You've got the lightweight number one contendership. This match has title implications. Glover Teixeira versus James Tahuna. Cerrone versus his weakness, which is a boxer. This guy has been training his takedown defense for so long, he is becoming a nightmare to take down. And then you've got the two huge lightweight prospects. As Ray said, you've got Kahib Namurga-Magomedov versus Abel Trujillo. That is going to be absolutely off the hook, although this might be Abel's uh, weakness. This might be his exposure fight. He has got holes in his game, especially in a submission game, but it should be good. You've got Jeremy Stevens, 145 pound debut versus the guy who looks at, like Antonio Banuelos. You've got a very 50 50 fight in Rick Story versus Mike Pohl. You've got Brian Bowles going to knock someone out. This fight card, man, is epic. I'm probably most looking forward to seeing Gray Maynard back, get back in there. However, you cannot count out. Mark Hunt, so I'm going to go with that. Mark Hunt versus JDS. I'm looking forward to it. Supposed to pick a prelim, Jay. Oh, yeah, wait, way to stick to the topic, buddy. Well, look, I just got a little bit overexcited, but if Kahib is on the undercard, Kahib Namurgamagamelov will take my <laughs> pick for the prelim fight. It sounds like you're having a seizure when you say his name. Eric? 
<laughs> Sorry, Jake, that one got me. Uh, before I uh, go into my breakdown, I just want to say that it's coming a, uh, a pretty good thunderstorm here. So if I cut out or whatever, my power goes out and I lose, I lose signal, I apologize, and uh, I'll, I'll catch you all next time. But it seems like it may be calming down. As far as the car, like, uh, like Jay said, awesome car stacked from top to bottom, minus the, uh, the main event, who <clears throat> I think is a, you know, a bit of a mismatch here. But uh, either way, I'm really excited to see Brian Bowles back since um, he is uh, from where I'm from. He's uh, originally from Charleston, West Virginia, which is about an hour away from me. And uh, I think he should completely work, Rip. I think it's going to be a little closer than uh, what some people are thinking, but – I think Bowles should come away with probably a UD, easy easy decision. Interested to see how Stevens comes back, uh, dropping to 145, also coming off his first ever knockout loss. Always interesting to see how people come back from the first knockout. With Khabib, uh, Nurmagomedov, and Abel Trujillo, I was very impressed with Trujillo's debut against Marcus Levesseur. He showed incredible takedown defense. He showed killer instinct, hence his nickname, Killer. He showed um, and good stopping power. <clears throat> but his weakness, as you stated, is uh, the submission game, which is you know, probably where Khabib shines at the most. But he also showed in his last fight that he does have some stopping power of his own, knocking Tavares you know, into uh, another dimension. Also, uh, pretty excited about the Max Holloway-Dennis Bermudez fight. If anybody saw the Dennis Bermudez versus uh, Matt Grice fight, High candidate for fight of the year. That was a badass fight. And I personally am a, a fan of Max Holloway, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. As for Pyle and Story, uh, I think that fight is uh, as well closer than a lot of people are saying. I think Story is a bad matchup for Pyle. You know, a, a really tough, rugged, in-your-face, grinder-like Story. I, I don't think it bodes well for Pyle. And uh, probably looking forward mostly to uh, the Khabib fight, too. <clears throat> yeah, I'm I'm uh, definitely looking forward to the Khabib fight. Um Mike Pyle versus Rick Story will be an interesting one, but personally, I'm I'm looking forward uh to to the two fights on the prelim Facebook card, which I rarely ever say. Uh Brian Bowles coming back. I believe this is Bowles' first fight since he fought Uriah Faber back at UFC 138, correct? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, been been a pretty long layoff for him, so kind of funny how uh, he's taking a long layoff and the week he's back. We got someone else from West Virginia on the show, uh, but personally I'm looking forward to Stephen Thompson. I think Nashawn Burrell is somebody that will be willing to stand and trade with Stephen Thompson. We've not seen Stephen Thompson fight uh, for a little over a year since Matt Brown pretty much mopped the canvas with him at UFC 145, so N- Nashawn Burrell is going to be a guy who's going to go in there and exchange with him, and I think we see another uh, high- highlight reel Stephen Thompson knockout like we did uh, when he fought Dan Stitkin. That was a great KO. The the uh, moneymaker combo he threw there was awesome. Um, and that brings us to the main card, the five fights to break down, starting off with Donald Cerrone and KJ Noons. Jay, you're up first. We were disagreeing. Um, I do agree that Cerrone's... Uh, Weakness has has been boxers, guys who can just put a pace on them with with uh, punches. But I just don't think Nunes is the level fighter that that you see in a guy like uh, Nate Diaz or um, wow, how am I blanking? Ant on or Anthony Pettis. Um, I'm I'm uh, thinking of the guys he's beat. He he definitely has beaten some pretty decent guys as uh, far as the striking game goes. Beat Melvin Gallard, beat Jeremy Stevens. Both of those guys can finish a fight pretty quickly. Dennis Seaver, a skilled kickboxer. Charles Oliveira, he's probably more of a mat mat guy. But um, yeah, I mean Donald Cerrone's five last five fights have all been against guys who who can trade leather. And Seaver, Diaz, Stevens, Gallard, and uh, Pettis. And I just don't think Nunes is good enough to work Cerrone out like that. Jay? 
It's hard to get Noon's rock, though, and we have seen the likes of Gillard, and we have seen even Stevens knocked out before. Cerrone's takedown offense really isn't the best. I mean, he's never really out. He's never really out-wrestled someone, and KJ Noon's has been working a ton on that aspect because for a long time his weakness was the takedown defense. He's finally starting to piece it together now. His record doesn't say it, but that Ryan Couture fight was mightily close. Other fights on his record, he's starting to get close and closer the Thompson fight was really close he's starting to put it all together and the Thompson fight is going to be an indicator of this fight but I think KJ Noons is finally in his prime Cerrone looked just I don't know what he's doing against Pettis but he didn't look anywhere near the skill set KJ Noons is going to push the pace and Cerrone is not going to like it but that's just my opinion I'm not perfect and whatever this is my underdog pick you are perfect in my eyes Jay uh, as for my pick, uh, I'm a I'm a big fan of KJ Noons, but I just don't think he has what it takes to, uh, to match up against Donald Cerrone. As Jake damn, said. it really is about to storm there. Shit. Yeah, you hear that thunder, man? It, it's it's coming down pretty hard here, man. So if I go out, I apologize. But anyways, uh, the people that Cerrone's been uh, been beat by, you know, Pettis, Nate Diaz. Pettis is just you know you know on another level striking than almost everybody in that division. With Diaz, it was more of like a, a cumulative effect. Like KJ is not the kind of boxer that Diaz is. He don't throw like an absurd amount of punches per round. He he's more of a tech, a technical boxer, but he doesn't throw you know crazy a number of punches. So I'm gonna I'm probably gonna lean Cerrone, but I think KJ is tough enough to go in there and last three rounds with him. So Cerrone decision. Cerrone decision that is the call from oh wait sorry Ray I just cut you the fuck off and I do apologize uh, I think KJ News is definitely being underrated I mean it wasn't that long ago that he he fought Nick Diaz uh, and he beat Nick Diaz pretty handily and no one gave him a chance in that fight um, straight boxing KJ News is a threat to anybody in that division but when you mix the rest of the game in uh, you know, Cerrone's definitely in with the shout. I don't know if he can get the takedown or not, but Cerrone's got leg kicks as well, which is not what we really see from KJ News with his boxing. Uh, I think Cerrone's going to win. If he gets, if he's able to get News down, I can see him getting a submission. If he's not able to get him down, I can see him winning a decision. But I think it's a very, very competitive fight. And to be fair, in most cases, these strike force guys that have come over have really come and shocked and, and pulled off surprise victories. Not in all cases, but in most cases. So you definitely can't rule KJ Noons out. Yeah, you uh, can't. And 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 I don't think he has like you know some crazy slim to none chance to win. But I think the odds are not in his favor. Our uh, boy Chris tweeted in saying Donald Cerrone out-wrestled All-American Jamie Varner in their second fight. Three takedowns to Varner's one. Um, yeah, so I don't think we were talking about wrestling. But all right. Or at least when when we were, I was looking at something else. Uh, looking at the run sheet, trying to look at all the cards on this main card. It actually is going to be a really great one. Uh, we have another lightweight fight. Gray Maynard taking on TJ Grant. Maynard actually making the news recently saying he almost retired after that Guida fight. If he would have lost, that he very easily could have retired. Taking on TJ Grant, a guy a lot of people aren't giving much credit to. I think Grant's a lot better than people give him credit for. The guy's uh, young, 29, the uh, Canadian out of Nova Scotia. He fought at the welterweights until just a couple of years ago before moving down to lightweight. He is a brown belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. The guy has not lost since moving down to lightweight in 2011. Uh, defeating Shane Roller, Carlo Prater, Evan Dunham, and Matt Wyman. All impressive victories. Um, and Gray's really going to be his first elite test. Uh, Dunham and Wyman are both excellent fighters, but not the kind of guy like Gray. Gray Maynard. Maynard's fought twice for the belt. And I am very interested in this fight. It's going to be a lot closer than a lot of people think. But I do still give it to Gray Maynard. The guy is a man possessed. He's, I mean... Outside of his two fights against Frankie Edgar, the guy is flawless, um, and 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 he also has beaten Frankie. Um, his uh, last fight against Guida, after that, uh, I guess what is it called when there's two? It's not a trilogy, or or actually, I I guess it was a trilogy fight because he fought Frankie earlier. 
but I do give it to Maynard. Uh, very close, though. Close, 29-28, judges nod. For me, this is a coin flip, man. I, I like both guys. TJ Grant has looked increasingly better in each fight. He, he looked like an absolute monster against Wyman, knocking him out against the cage with elbows from the clinch. He's been training his Muay Thai in Thailand a lot, so his striking has come up quite a few levels. And as for Maynard, the, uh, the comments you made about him saying he would had pondered retirement had he lost the Guida fight, that, that kind of worries me a little bit. I'm, it worries me maybe uh, wondering if his head's in the, if his mental game's in the right place or not. But, you know, with this being, you know, a fight with title implications, I think he'll come in ready. Grant dropping uh, had dropped down from 170. Maynard also is a uh, – a lightweight that cuts from well over, you know, 170, 180 pounds, 180 pounds. So I think it's going to be pretty even if they lock up. I just see, I just see Maynard being just a little, uh, just a little bit better, be a close fight. And I wouldn't be surprised if TJ Grant won. He, I, if I'm not mistaken, he's still an underdog on playground, so he's not a bad bet if you're if you're looking to put money. But I think I got to give it to Gray via very close 29-28 decision as well. Maybe even a split. I think this is a, is a really interesting matchup because <clears throat> we all know Gray's strength is his wrestling. But at the same time, when he's faced high-level jiu-jitsu, I know it's not probably been, been for a while, but he has been submitted before as well. Uh, not so, Maybe not so much in the main UFC, but I know he obviously lost to Nate Diaz in the house. And when he fought Nate Diaz next time, uh, he, he chose not to go to the ground with him. I think if he chooses to stand with TJ Grant, I think he's going to lose. TJ Grant's Muay Thai uh, looked amazing. Uh, he looked amazing against Dunham, and then what he did to Wyman was just unbelievable. I mean, Wyman is a fantastic fighter, and TJ Grant just smashed him. I think we might see an upset here, and I think we might see uh, Grant get another TKO win. I, could, I, think, I think it's Grant's time. And if he beats Gray Maynard, I can't wait to see him fight for the lightweight title. I think it's going to be... He's just come out of nowhere for me. He just looks fantastic. So I'm picking Grant to get off a, to get a TKO victory. This fight is insane. Um, as you guys have already mentioned, you've got this, this title implications. That suggests that TJ Grant is now one away. His Muay Thai, as Ray said, is on right now. It's on a very, very good level. You have a lot of TJ Grant fanboys out there right now. But he is riding a very good streak. I think he's 5-0. and oh. Maynard looks like he might even be on the way out. You know, he's... Has, has he gone past his prime? We're not quite sure. The Guida fight didn't look too good. The Edgar fight where he got finished, he didn't look too good. This is coming from a Gray Maynard fan. TJ is red hot. Maynard might not be looking so good. Grant can get the uh, brutal elbow finished like he has been doing against Wyman and things. It's going to come down to the wrestling and the jiu-jitsu of uh, Grant. I think if Maynard gets on top, then uh, then. TJ Grant is going to be in for a long night. However, Gray Maynard hasn't focused on his wrestling in a while. He's become very much a striker. He gave up trying to wrestle Edgar because he's too tired. So we haven't seen it in a long time. We don't know what's going on with his head right now, Maynard. This fight is very interesting. I'm just hoping either guy can beat Benson Henderson because I, I, I just like both guys more than Benson. Is that a crime? Yes, it is. It's racism, and racism is a crime. Moving on, light heavyweights. You got Glover Teixeira and James Tahuna, a couple of bangers. Everyone was talking about Glover after he completely annihilated the likes of Kyle Kingsbury and Fabio Maldonado. Uh, the hype train was derailed a little bit after a boring unanimous decision against Rampage Jackson, but he looks to get back on the minds of people thinking about the light heavyweight championship, taking on James Tahuna. Both of these guys are brawlers, and I feel like the fact that both of them are going to be happy to stand in the pocket and trade means that it could go to either one. James could finish the fight, but I think Glover does have, have heavier hands and because of James Tahuna's willingness to exchange, uh, I have Glover in this one via first or second round TKO. Ray? Sorry, I. Uh, <clears throat> this is a really interesting matchup, but I was obviously there live for James Tahuna's last fight against Ryan Jimmo, and he didn't look great in that fight. I mean, he got rocked early on, and then he, he ended up winning with his wrestling. Glover, uh, he didn't look great against Rampage, but Rampage is one of those guys that's horrible to fight against because he's. 
He's, he's a very powerful striker. He's got an awkward style. But at the same time, when he faced the guys before, Carl Kingsbury and Fabio Maldonado, he looked amazing. And I, I can see this. If this fight goes down to the ground, which I think it will, I can see Glover getting a submission. I think he's going to submit James Tahuna, uh, maybe in the second round. But yeah, I'm definitely leaning towards Glover. I think Glover's on the fast track to be talked about in the title picture soon. He needs to, he needs to fight a big, big name. But I, I think he's going in that direction. But yeah, I've got Glover to win. I'm going round two submission. I'm leaning uh, in the same way as Ray. Uh, <clears throat> I just I don't really see how Tahuna can win this fight other than maybe clipping Glover. Glover has been uh, knocked out, I think, once in his career, and Maldonado wobbled him with a, a lazy left hook. So, I mean, Tahuna does have power, but I, it's you know he's just got the puncher's chance. But um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, I kind I kind of think that Glover will look to strike with him, but once he gets him rocked, I think he'll drop down and probably look for an arm triangle, kind of like how he did with uh, Kingsbury. With Because um, I just recently watched, I was stumbling around on YouTube and stumbled upon James Tahuna versus Hector Lombard. And, you know, Tahuna, quite a bit bigger than Lombard at the time, he got rocked probably three, four times in that fly really hard. Now, I just I just think Glover's got way too much power to uh, for Tahoon at the last all three rounds. So I, I see him uh, rocking him probably second round and then getting on top and finishing with either an arm triangle or maybe a rear naked choke. This fight, man, you really can't pick against James Tahuna. He's found a way to win the last few, whether it was quickly or whether he's able to wrestle Jimmo. This fight, to me, is still hard to pick. I'm going to say Glover for now, but I think you guys are probably on the right tracks. Submission seems likely. Picking the submission for Glover Teixeira, that also could happen. You know he's from Brazil, so he's got the Brazilian jiu-jitsu to match. All right, the main and co-main event, both of them heavyweight matches, both of them with insane amounts of title implications. Obviously, you have the title fight in the main event, and this one could very well be a title eliminator match in the co-main event with Junior Dos Santos taking on Mark Hunt, who was able to get his visa issues resolved and will be leaving New Zealand if he's not already left yet to travel to the U.S. to UFC 160 in Las Vegas and take on Junior Dos Santos. Um, Both of these guys are not going to be afraid to stand and trade, sort of like the last fight. Neither will be afraid to stand in the pocket, and it's going to go down to the heaviest hitter. And just because of his speed and his, his, you know, I, I think Junior will be able to get in and out more than Hunt. Hunt's just not as athletic as Junior. I think both of them are equal when it comes to power punching. Um, I don't want to give either guy the strength advantage, but just the speed and agility of Junior to get in and get out and exchange when he needs to exchange, not take, not take more damage than he needs to. Um, I'm picking Junior Dos Santos. Jay? Man, this is, this is a good fight. Um, if you're, for anybody who loves the, who loves kickboxing or whatever, how can you not pick against Junior Dos Santos? Hunt seems to find the one punch and he's right in the, he is right in the fucking four fight longest current streak in UFC heavyweight, uh, the heavyweight division. It's crazy. Um, but Junior, he is the best striker. Let's, let's be real here. He has looked phenomenal, but man, Mark Hunt cannot be underestimated. I'm going with JDS, but I'm going to be rooting for Hunt, and I think that's that's going to be the reality of most people here. I'm going to lean the same way, uh, picking Junior to win, but definitely rooting for Hunt. He's had an amazing career resurgence as of late, you know, like, like Jay said there with the longest win streak in the heavyweight division at the moment. And he's always got that one punch power. I mean, all it takes is one shot. I mean, he, he could clip Junior, but I think the key to this fight is going to be Junior's speed, his in and out movement, and his timing. I don't see him being able to stop Mark Hunt. The only person that's been able to do that is uh, Melvin Manholf, who is just a phenomenal striker. And that he caught Hunt running, basically running in, which everyone knows makes the punch like ten times harder if it lands in the right spot. But I'm taking Junior Dos Santos probably by a unanimous decision, and I wouldn't be surprised if he uh, threw in a takedown. 
here and there, you know, maybe still around or maybe see if he can submit Mark Hunt. I think, I mean, there's no doubt about it. These are probably two of the best strikers in the division. And I think the big difference for me is going to be who's got the best chin. Not the speed, not the, not the, uh, no, not who throws the best punches. We know, we both know the hit hard. Who can take a punch more? And I just think Mark Hunt's that one who can take the punch more. I've got a feeling he's going to get the upset. I think if he lands one big overhand right, I think JDS will drop. I mean, Kane Velasquez had him on the ropes, and I think Mark Hunt hits harder than Kane. I think that we're going to see uh, Mark Hunt pull off one of the biggest upsets of the year and go on to fight, fight for the title. I'm going to pick Mark Hunt, knockout. Mark Hunt, knockout. Sugar Ray Thompson with the upset pick. Uh, that brings us to the main event, Cain Velasquez and Antonio Silva. I got a feeling none of us are going to be picking the underdog here. Cain and Antonio fought each other at UFC 146, and it was one of the most one-sided beatdowns we've seen in a good while. Cain Velasquez finishing the fight three and a half minutes in. Um, interesting stat from the fight I shouted out last night. Uh, UFC 146, the first time they fought Antonio Silva. Can anybody guess the total amount of strikes he he threw in that three and a half minute beatdown? Well, uh, it was a leg you, kick. It was a leg kick, and it was about I think it was about six or seven seconds in. He threw he threw, f- he threw four strikes the entire fight. Three uh, of them were on the mat. Yep, and uh, they were. I think one was a futile punch and the other two barely did any damage. Cain Velasquez did not endure any sort of damage from the fight. He he literally, I mean, not even a punch, to a solid punch. Um, Cain so handily dominated the first one, and the fact that Bigfoot Silva's going out saying he's not changing his game plan from the first fight, um, I don't know if he was injured or something, uh, but Cain is just, Cain has the tools it takes, stylistically Cain's a nightmare, just straight skill and athleticism wise, Cain's a nightmare for Big Bigfoot Silva, and I don't want to take a lot away from, from, uh, Bigfoot, because I do think he's a top 10 guy in the weight class, but you look at his last two wins, I really think both of those wins were because of faults his opponent made, rather than him coming out like some crazy bat out of hell. You had Alistair Overeem, who only lost because he put his hands down and wouldn't block his face, and you had Travis Brown, who fucked his knee up in the first round and couldn't go on. Like I said, I respect Silva, but I don't see any way he wins this fight. I'll agree with you, Jake. Uh, I just really don't see uh, any way Bigfoot can, can win the fight other than just clipping Kane. Kane has, uh, Kane has been rocked before a couple times. You know, he got finished by uh, JDS, of course. He got rocked by Congo, dropped twice in that fight, I believe. But, yeah, I mean, I just think Silva is going to be too big and too slow. Kane, Kane is just going to use his speed, his footwork, takedowns. Silva hasn't shown the best takedown defense. I just think Kane is just going to completely obliterate him again, probably. I think he'll last the first round this time. I think he'll make it into the second round. I'm going to go to Kane's second round knockout, TKO. I do think that uh, Bigfoot des- deserves this fight. I mean, he beat Travis Brown, regardless of whether Brown got injured or not. That's not that's not Bigfoot's Bigfoot's problem. All Bigfoot can do is beat who's put in front of him. Uh, and um, Alistair Overeem, he took some big punches off him. At the end of the day, he had better cardio in that fight because Overeem, obviously, we we he, it looked like he was coming off whatever gear he was taking, and he he didn't look the best, and he tired towards the end. He had his hands down, and he got he got knocked out. But Silver still needed to throw those punches, and Sil- Silver still needed to survive that early round, and he did that. So I do think Bigfoot deserves the fight. Do I think he can win? No. But I, don't, I think that's the same with most champions in most divisions. We've seen that before with most of the fights. Most title fights are pretty one-sided towards the champion just because of how good they are rather than how bad their opponents are. But I think he'll get another first-round stoppage. I mean, the amount of blood in the last fight between them two was just amazing. Um, but yeah, I think Kane will win in the first round again. I'd, I'd like to see Bigfoot do the upset because I think he's a very likeable person. I think he's very underrated. Uh, but I think Kane will get a first-round stoppage. 
I know, I know I said the exact same thing last week, but I've got to repeat myself. I am still awaiting Dana to say this is just a complete joke. Bigfoot is not fighting Kane. Big Nog got injured some months back, and we're seeing how many people would fall for this rematch between these two. Turns out a lot of people are idiots. Kane is fighting with Doom. Why can't Dana just say those words? Why? Why? Why is this a main event? Who? Who seriously? going, oh uh, yeah, I think that Bigfoot's going to win. Nobody, Dude, you sounded just like Kermit the Frog right there. <laughs> really, even Overeem was able to take down Bigfoot in their fight when his knackered, his TRT had worn off on all this crap. He could not... It's, if if Overeem can take him down, Kane is just going to... Kane is just going to destroy this chump again. I don't know why he's in this fight. I don't know who wants to see this fight. Some sicko playing sore and hostile in the back room or something. This is a joke, this fight, man. And I do agree, it is somewhat of a joke, but the reason it's being made is because every other top he- heavyweight is tied up. You got Big Nog and Verdum. We don't know who's going to win that fight. The winner of that would have made more sense. Junior, you can't give him another shot after taking that 25-minute beatdown. Um, but yeah, I do agree with all of you. I think Kane will cruise to a victory. Uh, and that does wrap up all the topics we had tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. You can catch the MMA Roundtable every Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 2 to 4 p.m. Pacific, and that's 10 to midnight if you're over in the U.K. Speaking of which, Ray, you want to plug MMA Mental? Yeah, uh, before I do that, just to, uh, we've got a contest over this week on MMA Victor, so come and check that out. Uh, you can uh, you can win two UFC tickets to an event of your choice. So go and check the site out to see how that is. Uh, MMA Mental. Uh, I interviewed Dwayne Ludwig today. That'll be on the show this week. So check that out. And we started a new show which features Luke Barnett giving his views on the main card fights for this weekend's UFC. That'll be published on Friday. So so check that out as well. Hell yeah! Check out MMA Mental and check out the Early Stoppage podcast on MMA Mental. How can we find that podcast? Jay. Yeah, sorry, sorry again. This I need to sort this out. Whatever the early stoppage is out every Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday. I hasn't got an official date. That's because we never have an official co-host. It's just me and somebody random talking for thirty minutes. Check it out. It's on the MMA Mental YouTube page. It's a barrel of laughs. This week we had Tyson Cunningham on, as I mentioned earlier. But just go out there and enjoy it, guys. Enjoy the shit out of it, and also the Word on the Street podcast. My boy Ramsey's, we're going to be doing it tonight at 11.15 Eastern. Going to have uh, Coach Jamie Huey on, who's bringing on Keto Andrews, uh, up-and-coming prospect. So definitely check out that. Follow him on Twitter at the Aunt Jimmy Show. Also follow MMA Victor at MMAVictor.com. Eric, I'm glad you were able to weather the storm and make it to the end. Uh, tell us where to find you, where to find MMA Troll, and where to find MMA Linker. Appreciate it, Jake. I as well. I'm glad that I uh, survived the storm and was able to uh, last to the end. <clears throat> Follow me on Twitter at Rico MMA 1990. Uh, look up the MMA Troll on Facebook for all your uh, current MMA news as well as some humor mixed in. Uh, MMA Linker on Facebook also has a page. We do news and uh, uh, round by round updates on the cards. Also look up MMA Linker and uh, join. You know. Become part of the forum discussions. A lot of knowledgeable, knowledgeable members on there. Look us up. Hell yeah, and definitely also check out that forum on MMA Victor too. If you want to be a part of the games, if you want to spend a zero, a buck, a hundred bucks, check it out. And of course, the MMA Podcast. Just follow us on Twitter, people. The MMA Podcast, or visit themmapodcast.com. We got an exciting month of June coming up. We plan on uh, having Adam Hunter, aka MMA Roasted, on the show. Also plan on ha- having Sam Cecilia along with uh, four guest Eddie Bravo. We're going to be aiming to bring Eddie back on the show in June. Thanks again for listening. It means the world to us, the amount of positive support we get. Uh, We will be back next Thursday with the show. That'll be May 30th. Check us out on May 30th with the MMA Roundtable. We'll be back. Till then, we gone. We gone.